Welcome to the Atheist and Christian Book Club, uh, a monthly gathering of believers and skeptics respectfully discussing important books from both perspectives. My name is James Walker. I'm co-founder of uh, the book club. Uh, I'm the Christian half of the uh, founding group. I am uh, work for Watchman Fellowship, the president of that organization. It's a uh, apologetics organization, Christian apologetics, uh, focusing largely on interfaith evangelism. Our other co-founder you'll meet in a moment is uh, Bill Cluck, former Christian, now atheist. And uh, we started the club um, over five years ago now. And uh, real excited to have uh, as a guest author uh, today on our club is Dr. Neil Ashinvi, uh, he's going to be discussing his book, Why Believe a Reasonable Reasonable Approach to Christianity. Uh, Dr. Shinvi grew up in Delaware and attended Princeton University as undergraduate, where he uh, worked on high dimensional function uh, approximation. He became a Christian in uh, Berkeley, uh, where he did his PhD in theoretical chemistry at uh, UC Berkeley on quantum computation. Uh, but in 2015, he quit his job at Duke to homeschool his four children. Uh, he presently serves as the principal of South Durham Academy for Math and Science, also known as Daddy Academy. In addition to uh, his book, Why Believe, he also authored the forthcoming book, Critical Dilemma, The Rise of Critical Theory, Theories and Social Justice Ideologies, Implications for the Church and Society, uh, which is uh, going to come out, I guess, later this year from Harvest House. It's out now. Right? It's out, get out in October, so it's out. In October. Okay, mm -hmm. great, great. Well, Neil, welcome to the Atheist and Christian Book Club. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, um, uh, I'm going to let uh, the first, what we're going to do on this is um, uh, Bill and I are going to ask you a couple of questions and kind of get the get this started. And then uh, a little bit into it, we're going to be opening it up to our members to, to ask questions. There's a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, always, we want you to text your, your question or that, that you have a question or comment. And uh, Brady or Daniel will take that and call on you when it's your time to uh, come up and ask your question. Uh, sometimes people prefer not to be on camera, and that's okay too. Just you can say, please ask this question for me, and we will relate that uh, uh, to um, Dr. Shinvi as well. And so uh, our co founder, uh, Bill Cluck. Uh, Bill, do you have a question or, or comment? Yeah, uh, a few comments. I really enjoyed Neil's uh, videos on critical race theory and critical nationalism. I actually knew nothing about them. And a little story, I'm from Richmond, Virginia, and I had a roommate that visited me, and he goes, you got Confederate generals all down Monument Avenue. And I went, doesn't everybody? <laughs> so I was... Uh, talking to someone from Richmond, Virginia the other day, and he said, oh, they removed all the uh, monuments of uh, the Confederate generals. And my thing is, well, hey, put a neat abstract statue or, you know, at least replace it with something cool. <laughs> and Neil and I have a lot in common. We both are from Raleigh, Durham, great area to live, wonderful place. And uh, we both agree that we need to go and get the bad news out about Christianity to the kids to inoculate them because that in one of your videos you said you know don't let them get blindsided when they go to college and where so forth get the stuff out there so speaking of christian nationalists i'd like to uh, refer to a christian nationalist in the bible i'm at mark 7 26 and i'll just read now the woman was a gentile a phoenician by birth and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, yes, but even the dogs eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her for this statement, go your way, the demon has left you. So my question to you, Neil, is doesn't Jesus seem like a racist, sexist, kind of oppressor type that you're describing in as a Christian nationalist? 
Yeah, I think you that actually the passage always used to bother me as a non-Christian. I read it, and I was like, that seems kind of mean of Jesus. I mean, she's coming in, her daughter's sick, and you're telling her she's a dog, and you know, you're saying she's not worthy of your healing because you were sent to Israel. And so it bothered me. I thought, well, Jesus, Jesus isn't very it's a hippie Jesus. I thought he's like a <laughs> nice guy. What happened? I mean, uh, but I think you read the passage in Mark. Is that right? I believe yes. the parallel passage in Matthew yeah. and Luke. They're usually longer. They often elaborate on Mark stories. So uh, if you look at the context, so this woman's following Jesus around and this, and the disciples, his disciples are saying, send her away. She's bothering us. This Gentile, you know, get her out of here. But Jesus doesn't send her away. He, he So he lets her come to, he lets her come to him and make this request. And, but here's the thing. What he's basically saying is, you're not one of God's people. How does she take that? She doesn't say, how dare you? I I have a need and you will do it for me. She says, that's right. I'm not one of God's people, but you're underselling God's graciousness. Even the dogs. So she's saying, yeah, that's right. I am outside of God's kingdom. I'm a dog in God's eyes, but she turns it around on him. Having such faith in God's bounty says, actually, I'll use your logic and and press for you to heal me anyway, even though I am an outsider. And th- what does Jesus say? Woman, you have great faith. Your daughter's healed. So in obviously now, now, so even on a totally sort of secular perspective, there's a lot going on there. We have to understand that the whole Bible is very emphatic that the Jews were God's chosen people, God had a special salvific relationship with the Jews, not with anyone else. And the way to then to come into a relationship with God was only through the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. So what Jesus is saying is, do you understand what's going on here? You're coming to me being like, oh, you're a magician, heal my daughter. And he's like, that's not how it works. Do you want to come into God's community because you're outside of it? And she says, "I basically, I do. I am acknowledging outside of it, and I do want the blessings of it because it's overflowing even to the Gentiles. And he says, that's exactly right. Your daughter's healed. So again, there's a lot there. There's another story actually similar, Bill, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which is when um, Jesus, uh, wasn't it, isn't it someone, a Gentile is calling out son of David of mercy on me. And Jesus is like, time out, son of David. Wait, you know, wh- what do you say? Do you, you know, basically, he's, he's calling out and saying, when you're saying that, what do you really mean? Am I a magician or are you really calling on me as Messiah? And when he, when he, when the, the, he was a man, when he basically acknowledges, yeah, I, I'm acknowledging that you're the Jewish Messiah, then Jesus says, yes, you're healed. So Jesus is always looking for more than just physical healing. He wants, I, he wants that recognition that, I, yes, I'm unclean. I need more than just magic. I need to come into relationship with the God of Israel. So that's my long answer. But by the way, that answer I just gave you is extremely standard in terms of like Christian commentaries throughout, I think, centuries. So it's not like I'm making this up. (laughs) Oh, by the way, before I forget, your book is Why Believe. We Mm -hmm. have a book called Why I Believe by one of our members, Ken Daniels, who was a former missionary to Africa who tells his story. So it's going to be really interesting to see a book so similarly tighter, uh, how you guys are going to interact. Anyway, back to you, James. Yeah, um, I've got some questions too, but uh, Ken's actually here right now. And since you mentioned that, uh, maybe we'll go ahead and put you up now, Ken. Uh, Ken Daniels, uh, you uh, had a question uh, for Dr. Shinvi? Oh, yes. Uh, Thanks for for being here, Dr. Shinvi. I enjoyed uh, reading your book. a lot of uh, good, strong um, arguments to think about. Um, and I, I want to say I, I fully uh, agree with uh, Stephen Pinker and the blank slate. I read his book a number of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was glad to see you reference it and and agree with the premise that humans are, are basically flawed. Um, so I, I don't have any problem accepting that premise, um, including the, the idea that that we're flawed at the level of of our thinking and our beliefs and 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 rationalizing. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes you know, there's really smart people that that believe uh, very contradictory things, and they mm-hmm. all think they have the greatest rational you know reasons to believe those things. 
Um, it's only the other people that are flawed in their thinking. Mm. That, you know, they themselves are immune from from those same flaws. And so I've been on both sides of the divide of faith. Uh, I grew up as a missionary kid myself, and then uh, joined Wycliffe Bible Translators uh, and uh, served in in uh, Niger, mm -hmm. Africa, for um, not that very long. It was about three years um, that we were there to. Uh, learn the language of a of a minority group uh, in, in view of translating the Bible into their language. Um, but it was during the, my time there that as I was reading through the Bible uh, that uh, that I came to just uh, I, I just I couldn't believe it anymore. Um, and so left the mission field as more or less a deist uh, and then eventually uh, uh, went more in an agnostic direction, uh, atheist leaning agnostic. Mm. Um, and, you know, we've read a lot of books in this club, and a lot of them have very similar arguments. And um, I think yours is similar to some others what we've read. You, you had a stronger piece on, I think, at the end about the gospel and sin and, and uh, fallenness and so forth. So that was a little bit different twist. It was a little bit more um, homiletic towards the end than some mm -hmm. of the apologetic books would be. So it, it was challenging to to I actually listen to it on Audible, mm. uh, and just got through reading uh, finishing that today. But uh, I guess what I want to say is that having been on both sides of 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 the fence, and having been certain um, that what I believed before, that, you know, that psychological certainty, you know, I know it's got to be true. There's no way it couldn't be true because of all mm. these arguments. Um, and then and then now being on the other side and also feeling certain that. Christianity can't be true, um, you know, having similar certainty, if not greater certainty than I had before. Um, it just highlights to me um, that you call it fallenness, I call it um, flawedness or whatever it is, whatever you want to call it, or sin. Um, just that ability to rationalize and think that the arguments that we embrace are stronger than they really are, because it must be the case that some of us think that the arguments that we that we think are strong really aren't because otherwise you wouldn't have Muslim apologists who are equally certain uh, as to some Christian apologists or uh, anti-Christian uh, Jewish apologists, uh, anti-missionary apologists, they call themselves, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that are certain about what they believe. So how do you, how do you escape this trap of thinking that the arguments are really stronger than they, than they really are um, given that we all, are susceptible to that yeah That's good question thanks ken um one thing i think you do is you expose yourself to other arguments mm -hmm. right so it's, it's very easy to say my arguments are ironclad when you're sitting in a room with locked doors and no books because you know because right. you've never heard the other arguments so one of the ways that you you know test to make sure that you are thinking rightly is through things like this dialogues like this where you talk to people that have very different worldviews or different beliefs and uh Find out what their strongest arguments are. Uh, and I think over time, uh, you do come to realize, or, I mean, hopefully, uh, that I think I have good reasons. You know, why? Not because I've am hiding in a bunker, but because I've list I've read, you can look on my back wall. I can't see it, but I have a whole shelf of books that are almost entirely written by atheists. And I've read them. I didn't, I didn't just read them to just gotcha and I read them because like, okay, what's I want to hear the best arguments. Actually, I started this whole journey because mm -hmm. i went i think i actually mentioned this in the book i went on a uh an atheist blog he was a yale graduate and he a, a friend of mine said oh he will deconvert you he'll talk you out of christianity and we uh, he, he told me go read this book and that book and so i did and um frankly i don't think at the time either of us were very equipped to defend our own worldviews but that's that got me started in again reading primary sources so that's one way the other way, and I think I mentioned this in the book as one of the arguments, but when anyone comes to me and says, uh, you know, I just I just don't think Christianity is true or even but I, but I want to know I'm committed to knowing what's true. I don't want to live a lie. I want to live a, a fantasy world. I want to know the, the reality. Well, to, from, first I'd ask them, well, do you want Christianity to be true? Yes or no? And just and I, that's a you know, that's a subjective, honest question to ask yourself. Do I want this to be true or not? I mean, I do, but if I'm honest, there are parts of Christianity I also wish weren't true. I don't 
like the idea of hell. I don't like it. Doesn't matter. I'm a scientist. I just don't. Oh, I, I like this part of the theory. I don't like that part. So I'm going to take that part of the theory, but not this part. You can't do that. So if I'm, I try to honestly sit down and say, well, do I want Christianity to be true or not? And what parts do I wish I weren't true? Whatever. Okay. Um, of course, for me as a Christian, I'm like the parts that I don't like are the parts where I need to change. Not it's like a scientist. <laughs> the parts of a theory that I don't like are the ones that are showing the where I'm inconsistent or are not thinking carefully. Anyway, but then so I think atheists and Christians can do that exercise. And if presumably the atheist, if the atheist comes back and says, "Well, I don't want Christianity to be true, but I just think it is true." Okay, I so I think I think I think atheism is true. I, I don't want a Christianity to be, but thank goodness it's not true. Um, one thing that I would say for right off the bat is what you said. Given our propensity for rationalization, mm-hmm. if you want Christianity to be true, then you should be very careful because we are always inclined to bend the evidence to make our own worldview what we want it to be. Right. Right. That's one side. But the other side, and I think, but to, to be purely honest if i talk to most atheists um they don't want christianity to be true for many reasons They're like the god of the bible like dawkins said is this evil misogynistic brutal cruel blah blah, blah all this stuff uh, you know bill said isn't jesus racist and uh, sexist and he's imperialist and the christian nationals so there, there's all and that's i think again i think that's honesty i appreciate honesty i don't want i don't like the god in the bible i don't like the figure of jesus okay but so that would then indicate then um, you have to be careful because essentially if Christians can be wish fulfillment, uh, can it can be engaged in wish, so can atheists, right? <laughs> they can also be wanting atheism to be true. Um, but then the second question I'd ask is this, why do you care about the truth? Because I think most atheists would say, and I mentioned this in the book, but they'd say, well, I don't care what I want. I, even if I don't want it to be true, I, I want to know the truth. I will submit myself to the truth, whatever it happens to be. But then, the, as I mentioned in the book, well, why though? Like occasionally, I'll find people who say, "I wish Christianity were true," and I'm like, "Great, just turn off your brain and believe." And they say, "I oh no, what are you talking about? I can't do that. That you're an apologist, not a a fideist." Or and I say, "No, no, no, just just close your brain, throw away, burn all your books, go going to church, and after like five years." You'll just believe. You'll you'll believe it'll become like you'll be brainwashed. And again, they're aghast. They say, I can't believe you're saying this. I say, okay, stop time out. I was joking. But your intuitive bedrock belief is that you ought to seek the That, explain that to me. Yeah. Neil, let me just cut in. Yeah. I was at the Atheist Book Club. We have a book club here in Dallas. The atheists are pretty much clueless, your typical atheists. <laughs> they don't know about fine-tuning the mass density of the universe, yeah. the genetic uh, regulatory systems. I was actually, Dan couldn't make it, so I was kind of defending the faith for him yeah. because I was just like, you guys don't know anything. Right. I don't expect you to know Dale Allison and Jesus scholarship, but golly, you guys are pretty much clueless. But what I'm saying is you're dealing with Ken Daniels, who has read everything, mm-hmm. who really wanted to, mm-hmm. you know, stay in the faith. He was a freaking missionary. OK, mm-hmm. so I just go with what the Bible says. So when Jesus says another example, um, hey, can I bury my dad? Oh, no, we got to things to do here. Let the dead bury their dead. If you heard that from someone at work, you go, what a jerk boss, you know? But so we, we see through Christian goggles, through our culture. So we, it's almost impossible. Even smart people can't escape, escape bias. So even what I'm saying is it's very hard to get your biases uh, out of the way. And by the way, Ken and I do believe in Jesus. We believe mm. he was a historical person. Right. We are not mythicist. And there, the, what we just said about Jesus being kind of a jerk, well, that shows you this probably came from Jesus. Why would you embarrass yourself? As John Dominic Crossan said, two things um, are historically reliable, that Jesus was uh, baptized by John and that he was crucified. Right. Anyway, back to you, Ken. I know you got questions. But I just want to, so Bill, you said, you know, it's very hard for us to escape our biases, right? 
almost impossible. Well, but it's here's just, my question. You know, zebra might, might as well escape the stripes. Why do you want to? Because I want to know the truth. Why? That's a, that's a question. Why? Well, for one thing, I'm facing an eternity in hell where after the first billion years, the next billion's just started. And, you know, I'm escaping this torment, as Jesus described, and punishment. And as Lazarus said, get me out of this friggin' place, so <laughs> which he richly deserves. So, uh, yeah, I'm with you, my man. Right, but but that's you're assuming that Christianity is true right there. You said, well, I want to escape. You know, so you're saying it might be true. And that's why I want to know the truth. Absolutely. Here's where atheists go wrong. There's evidence, as you so well said in your book, uh, that Christianity is true. It started in Jerusalem where it could be easily falsified. There's no reason that disciples had checked out why this thing even continued. Okay. But what I'm trying to say is we have so much Christian interpretation and we basically did not inherit Jesus Torah observant Christianity, we inherited Pauline Christianity, the co-founder of Christianity. So Christians don't realize that. They go, go to John. Don't go to John. Nothing in that Jesus probably said. Go to Galatians. That's where you go, need to go first. But anyway, go, go ahead. No, so but what I'm saying is that you say, well, I want to know the truth because uh, of I might be facing eternity in hell. But You'll only be facing eternity in hell if Christianity is true. Sure. Okay, so you. what about in the other areas of your life? You also want to know the truth there? Of course. Okay, but why? Well, let's say pickleball. I watch pickleball videos because I want to be a better pickleball player. You know, pretty simple. Okay, so but it's about preference. So, so you're saying that you would be a Christian purely okay you'd seek the truth because of basically personal uh for you want to have basically be happy for eternity no let me just explain yeah Ken yeah. and i were christians yeah, i was so yeah. christian at 17. yeah when we saw the critical scholarship yeah then we said something's wrong here there's a chance christianity could be true because of there's evidences right for it. Uh, it's the world's largest religion should give you pause. But there's also evidence. Let me give an example. Paul said that 500 people witnessed the risen Christ, some sure. of whom are alive today. Well, that doesn't seem he's making an agenda. He's just kind of saying it off the cuff. Mm -hmm. That would be great. But we, it's not that great of evidence because we would love to depose those people to, hey, when did you see Jesus? What did he wear? What uh, was he like? But we just got to have an offhand, you know, remark. And plus, the Gospels had a theological axe to grind. They were obviously biased. But I think, I think, uh, if I might interrupt, uh, the, I think Neil is is asking something more foundational. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Why? Why? Why should truth matter to us? And I did find that to be one of the more interesting sections of of your book, and, sure. and one that hadn't really been raised in in a lot of our other readings. Sure. So it, it did make me think. Um, a bit that gave me some pause uh, because I do care about what's true and what's not true, and I and I was asking myself, well, why why should I care? Why you know whether something is true or not? And I think you, I think throughout the book you you did a good I good job of raising alternative views and objections and different angles and and how atheists might might answer certain questions. And I think. I think you raised the util you, you, the utilitarian aspect of it. Well, mm. yeah, if we're if we're aligned with the truth in general, like you know, if you're looking for water and you uh, uh, you see evidence that that you know there's there's footprints going in one direction or another, you know, your brain makes conclusions to say, okay, water's got to be in that direction sure. rather, rather than the other direction. It could be a matter of life and death. So there's the instrumental or utilitarian value of truth. But I think. I think you you raise examples of where like you, your mother is dying. They don't match and, up. Yeah. Yeah, your mother is dying, and and she she's a, she's a believer. Do you do you do you tell her that okay, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a believer now, or yeah, I'm going to see you in heaven or whatever. Just trying sure. to make her feel comfortable or whatever. Um, so so is truth is is truth paramount, or is there times when you know when with there's no utilitarian downside to that, right? To to say right to give a little fib. Um, I, I think that you know there's there's utilitarianism and then there's rules-based utilitarianism where you you take 
you take general principles that generally apply, like in mm -hmm. general, the more we seek the truth, the better, the better outcome our lives have, you know, so it, but there are cases, there are certainly edge cases, maybe more than just edge, edge cases. Maybe there's a lot of cases where that doesn't necessarily uh, hold true. So maybe we should be not so concerned about the truth. But I think in general, like when I come up to a stop sign or a stoplight, mm -hmm. if there's nobody traveling, you know, if I don't see anybody off to the right or to the left, there's nobody, you know, I'm out in the countryside and, you know, I could just roll through that stop sign, stoplight and just keep going, you know, mm -hmm. and, I might I might fear the law, but there's no I don't see a police car or anything, so I might as well just keep going. Um, but there's something in our nature that says, okay, well, there's a rule here. It's based on the fact that normally going through stop stoplights is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to go do that across the board, just you know, just because it's a general principle. Even though in this particular case, you know, it doesn't really hold true that there's any advantage in stopping at the stoplight uh, or at least you know full coming to a full stop. Uh, so I think I think you can always bring up edge cases to say, well, this this proves that, uh, you know, following the truth isn't always the best principle. There's sure. edge cases. I think, you know, and I don't believe in, in a, I believe in objective truth, but I don't believe in objective morality. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I, I, I wish there was I, I do wish that there was objective morality because it would be easier to say, don't do that. And, you mm -hmm. know, I could I could hold hold things against people or, you know, keep them in line, use that as kind of a, a, a hammer to, to, you know, to keep people in line. But, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to give up the idea that there exists objective morality because I just don't, I can't come up with a reason that there should be, I mean, in my, in my worldview. So it's just a, a matter of something I have to accept, um, even though I might want it to be true. Yeah, so uh, let me say a couple of things. One is that, you know, rule-based utilitarianism, one, I would just say that uh, if you can't account for edge cases, Nietzsche would say, well, don't be a loser. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, no, no one's, so watch, well, I, I generally want to do, like, I don't want to murder my neighbors the rule. Yeah. It's like, well, mm -hmm. you're a coward. Just do it if it's going to benefit you. And he's basically saying you're a slave still. Break out sure. of that illusion of morality. Yeah. Be, dare to be a, a real man, not a, you know, that's not his, a you know, that's not my view. I, you know, I, I have my own preferences and I'm going to follow those preferences. Okay. My preference uh, happens to be, if I'm honest, I, you know, I'm faithful to my wife. She's a believer. I'm, you know, I love her. I love my kids. I want to, you know, I want their respect. I want, I want to live in a community where people look up to me and I look to up, up to other people mutually. That's the life I want to live. So that's the life I'm going to live. It's not because I have a lawgiver telling me that's how I have to do it. Right. So then that's just pure preference. And so this is, is. and then, yeah, it so is. Like it, yeah exactly. Purely, so that, yeah, the, purely what I would say is to both of you, then it seems mm -hmm. to me like if you're both committed to, well, and actually both in, Bill even said, mm -hmm. you know, I want to know the truth because you give a utilitarian reason. I might be facing hell. That's pretty mm -hmm. infinitely bad. So yeah. I really want to avoid that. Right. Well, then I would say, why, what on earth? are you doing reading atheist books like Bart Ehrman? And if, if the risk is so high that if you're wrong, you go to hell. And if you're right, you just die and rot. Pascal's leader is going to come and bite you. Well, full no, I, mean, I mean, the same could be true of Islam. Islam could be true. We could all oh, be going to hell. I, I, I agree. I, I agree. But you, so yeah. but the point is what should be ruled out for you mm -hmm. is the, is the, 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 the one possibility with basically no or minuscule upside you should just, that's, a, that's a, a dead option for you. Atheism is a dead option. You're not going to go to hell on atheism. Yeah. So well, you, I mean, I think that leaves out. I, I don't think necessarily we have a choice in what we believe. I mean, it's. Uh, oh, no, but I you have a choice in what you read. That's my point. Yeah. It's not about believing. Well, I'm not a dox, uh, doxastic voluntarist. Uh, what I'm saying yeah. is you just burn all your atheist books. Yeah. Read nothing but religious books until you come. To, you think, well, you know, it, let's say you, you, you Bayesian here. You're, you, there's a ten percent chance Christianity is true. There's a five percent chance Islam is true. Two percent chance Hinduism is true, and there's a you know seventy percent chance atheism is true in it. Okay, well just burn that seventy percent because it's not going to lead you anywhere. It's not going to lead you to heaven, and it's not going to keep you out of hell. So now you have a couple live options in terms of avoiding hell. So this is the kind of if you're a pure utilitarian, which it sounded like you guys are kind of leaning on that. Well, you better not be an atheist. That's irrational. No, I mean, I, I, I am a more of a kind of a preference 
type person. I think that, you know, I, like I mentioned, I, I prefer to live a certain way. I prefer the world. I prefer to live in a world that has certain uh, where people behave in certain ways. Um, I can't I can't rise above that, that it's all a preference as much as I would like to be able to say that, you know, a, a God and, uh, you know, a God, a, a transcendent God has made rules that, that say you can't, you, you know, it, this is wrong or this is sin. I would like for that to be the case, honestly. I just don't think it is. But, but so I'm again, I'm posing that challenge to you. Mm -hmm. Burn all your atheist books. Read nothing but the Bible and Christian literature. Or no, pick your religion. Pick the one that you think is most likely. It sounds like you you said Christianity is probably more evidence based than than I don't know Scientology. I, you know, just to pick on Scientologists, I don't know. But pick the one that you think is the least likely to lead you to hell, and then just shut your mind off. Turn off your brain, start going to that religious service, start singing the songs, brainwash yourself. So what and you're I, saying is well, yeah. then... By the way, Neil, yeah. when when Ken deconverted, when he yeah. was about to leave the mission field, they told him just to read Christian books for six months. But, but wait, but, but so yeah, I did. And, but why didn't you keep doing it? Again, I, I know it's hard to turn off your brain and you'll their intuition will be screaming, this is wrong, this is mm -hmm. wrong, seek the truth. But that's my point in the book. <laughs> There's it, something yeah. in our hearts that rejects this yeah, relativism. And I, did, I yeah. did read only Christian books, and I came back around. Actually, they, it had the intended effect. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, you know, eventually I couldn't. Um, you know, my mind kept thinking and going places, and I just I found I couldn't really rein it in. You know, from to, towards what I wanted to believe. It just it was it was like asking somebody to read books to say that. Um, you know, that 9-11 was a was an inside job. You know, some a lot of people believe that strongly and they have all these evidences. Yeah. Uh, you know, just read this. Just read this. It's like, well, you know, no, I don't want to waste my time, you know, because it just doesn't seem. But see, the, so the question you have to settle for yourself is, are you really utilitarian? Because the rational, which you, I'm, like, I'm, I'm working through your own worldview here. Yeah. You're claiming no, I, I, I only care word, about avoiding him. I yeah. use the word rule-based utilitarianism in yeah. that case when you were asking about truth. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was in the concept of truth. It wasn't necessarily about morality. Because I understand all of the all the uh downsides of utilitarianism, all the all the yeah. challenges that there are there. It's it's a there's nothing, there's nothing that, and that's why I adopt, you know, preference-based morality. What, right. Whatever is our preference, you know, and I try to convince other people to believe, you know, to behave certain ways and they try to convince me and whoever convinces the other, that's kind of how it works out. Um, so that, I'm not a utilitarian from that perspective, but I, yeah. I, I, I do generally think that, that following the truth is going to lead to a better outcome in life in general. Now, but, there's, now I'm there's trying, exceptions. I'm trying yeah, yeah. Well, and then the big exception is like in the Pascal's wager, which which mm -hmm. you brought up, Bill. I thought Bill brought up very saliently is that mm -hmm. I prefer not to spend eternity in hell. So, so if I if I can summarize in what you're saying is mm -hmm. that if a if a religion can gain an advantage, you know, whether it's true or not, whether it's a true religion or not a true religion, by instilling the fear of hell in in people, mm -hmm. whether to come into their religion or not to leave it. And, and thereby gain uh, a a sticky advantage because it's a religion that has the belief in hell is a stickier religion than one that doesn't. I mean, nobody nobody uh, uh, turns their guts inside and out as to whether leave deism or enter deism, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it's gut wrenching to either enter or leave uh, Christianity or Islam because of the you know the stakes involved. Sure. But what you're saying is if a religion can uh, can propose that there's such a thing as hell and those that are inside the fold are, are immune from hell and those that are outside are are, are 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 subject to hell then that's all you need to really just get off the ground and 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 keep people and draw people in it's it's like an unfair advantage to say ah oh, you know we're just gonna we're gonna propose this and therefore everybody has to kowtow to what we say because because we have the religion that says there's there's hell you know, that's how I see it. I mean, it's but, it's like but, an unfair advantage. But what I'm trying to do is show you that on your own assumptions, you ought to be thinking that way. I'm not saying that you should think that way. I'm saying that given what you told me about your own rules, mm -hmm. that, that you're committed to that. Now, I what I would say as a Christian is that no, actually, and, and it's for me, it's coherent. 
is that Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life. So God absolutely demands we seek the truth. And Christianity is true. That's coherent. But for, uh, say, a person who's an atheist, who's utilitarian, and who also says, it's absolutely, I want to avoid hell. Like, then what are you even doing? Because you're not acting like you're, you don't live your life just tearing your heart and weeping and crying. And, you know, you kind of just go along your life. I'm assuming you seem like pretty well adjusted. Like everybody else does, you know, you have friends, you go bowling, you watch TV. Yeah. You're not living like you're on, you're really fearing oh, I hell. Mean, I get in a car and I, there's maybe a 0.1% chance that I'm going to get killed in a car accident at some point in yeah. my life, you know. Um, and, but I, yet I do it anyway, just because, I mean, the advantages of, uh, of doing so outweigh the disadvantage or the the, the chance and so oh, i think the mistake that you're making is thinking that that i think it's even a 10 percent chance i mean you are you're certain that christianity exists i'm certain that you're certain but do you, are you certain that i'm certain you know i i mean i don't i think it's probably less than a chance that i'm going to die in a car accident than i'm going to i mean much less otherwise i wouldn't even risk my i mean um yeah i understand that the the uh the concept of hell and and how how dress how how uh, immeasurably um, serious it is, mm. um, and yet, despite all that, I I don't believe it. Just doesn't it doesn't ring true. So if it doesn't ring true, I, it doesn't matter what the percentages are. It just it doesn't ring true. But again, <laughs> you, you're you're saying that the whole rule following seeking truth thing is just kind of a heuristic for you. But you and you get but so but, but you get that if hell's there. That mm -hmm. sort of it swallows up all the other probabilities. And even if it's 0.01% chance that Christianity is true, man, the downside is so bad. Or Islam. But mm -hmm. which you can't be living this sort of plain old vanilla atheist secular life where you kind of do Like, for, for example, why don't I, when I get into the car, worry that it might crash? And if I think about it within, I'm like, well, because that would be terrible and bad, but I believe Christianity is true. So I'll go and be with Jesus. Right. And, or when I say goodbye, I'm going to DC tomorrow. I'm flying, you know, to DC to say goodbye to my kids and I'll miss them. And I, you know, who knows the plane could crash. I might die. But again, I have to remind myself, Hey, if reality is, as you say, it is, you don't have to fear. So again, I'm Christianity so, is about living a coherent uh, part yeah, of it. Good, is living, but yeah, here's the good, thing, good. Neil. Yeah. He, here's the thing. You go to these hip, cool churches. Mm -hmm. They most of them have no clue. They couldn't put Jesus in history if their life depended on it. They're just going with the flow. Here's the thing: Ken is a well-read uh, researcher, and he he cares. Uh, you're you're about putting me truth. too high up. Uh, you're mm -hmm. putting me on a pedestal. I'm not anywhere near. Well, the, there is a lot of sin in your life. I mean, sexual sin. Let's be honest here, Ken. So no, it's good. so. Um, but here's the thing, Neil, is most Christians, if you showed them the bones of Jesus in an ossuary, they wouldn't skip a beat. They would just go, hey, who's going to, is the uh, you know, third day coming to the you know thing? They don't care. Do you understand that Ken and I are post-Christian? We have gone to the mountain. We've read Dale Allison, who, right. by the way. Well, I, I do want to follow up says, on what he's asking, though, uh, in that, like, because uh, just to, to fill to finish that thread is that uh, I want to pose back a question to you, Neil. Yeah. If Christianity was not e didn't e didn't even exist as a religion, yeah. let's just make a hypothetical. And maybe there's only Islam and all the other religions. There's you know there's all, there's other religions that that uh, espouse the the doctrine of hell, but Christianity doesn't exist. Yeah. Um. This is purely hypothetical, right? Sure. So would you? Would you try to convince me if you were, I, I don't know what you would be. Let's say you're just a neutral observer. You're not sure. anything. As a neutral observer, would you be admonishing me to just not read any books but Islam because that's the biggest religion and it teaches the doctrine of hell? Uh, you know, is is that is that really what you would think that the best way to live is, is to just because one religion happens to to propose the doctrine of hell that we should automatically give it some deference that it otherwise wouldn't have? Uh, I may, maybe I'm not being clear. What I'm saying is given your claims about how you evaluate worldviews and, and what you want in life and what your goals, right? Given then for you, I'm pointing out, you're not living really consistently. 
You yeah. ought to be desperate. You ought to be throwing away all your. Now, again, I, I'm not saying be a creep. I'm just saying pick the the of uh, pick the biggest thing you want to avoid and then it, focus on avoiding that and be and, and yeah you're going to be a neurotic mess and you're going to be weeping yeah, I mean, all the time and desperate but i mean that's that's what you ought to be right yeah i mean you're giving me some challenging things to think about yeah, but yeah. I'm throwing it back at you and asking you to answer that question do you think that is that how you would recommend that oh well, no no sorry if i okay, so i so now okay so right, are, right now what i'm saying a, is you're a neutral observer sure. and you're you're observing the world and you see that Islam is the biggest religion and it and it teaches the doctrine of hell. Christianity doesn't exist. This is the okay. hypothetical world. So what, right? what I would argue, so let's say, so again, I, you're, but you're yeah. postulating, I'm answering as someone who, who, there's no Christianity at all in the world. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I'm just making that up. Yeah. What I would argue is mm -hmm. that based on what I say in the book, which is that if we believe we have an obligation to seek the truth, mm -hmm. right? And I just intuitively, like I intuitively just know there's a right, a right and wrong. I don't maybe even I don't even know what it is, but there's a category out there of right and wrong. Right. right. I, you you'll never be able to convince me that no, you know, raping little kids is just it's just a thing. No, it's not a thing. Every bone in my body cries out that it's yeah. ridiculous. And right. then if you if you claim no, 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 you can just burn all the books in your house and believe what makes you feel happy. I'm like, no, no, I know that truth matters. Okay, so that's my bedrock. Mm -hmm. But that only that that bedrock literally only makes sense if there is a God and not any God, a good God and a God who wants us to take the truth. Now, if there's no Christianity, what I would tell what I would say in that universe, which is not real, I would say, give you those arguments. I say, hey, we both need to be desperately seeking the God who is true. I know he's there because he explains those things that I can't account for. If you come to me and say, no, there's no, there's no God like that. Like, dude, how do you explain the fact that I just you it's like trying to convince me that I don't exist. I'm like, look, go away. Like, just forget it. Mm -hmm. Convincing me that they're, that raping little babies is fine and that I can believe fantasies and that's fine too. Just, mm -hmm. It's like trying to convince me that words don't exist. So you don't like, want that to be true. You don't want it to be true that there's not objective morality, right? Well, I don't want it to be true, but also which rationally, I, I don't, it's like saying, do you want it to be true that you're, uh, that, that words exist? I'm like, I guess I want it to be true, but it just, mm. it's like, you can't, it's not, it's not like about once. It's like, you're using words. I, do you want to believe that you're not a, a kumquat? Yes, I guess I do. But also I know that I'm not. Do I want to believe that two plus two equals four? I do want that, but it's also mm. obviously true. In that kind of sense, and that's called a fund, a foundational belief, a properly basic belief. Mm -hmm. Of course, morality exists. Of course, truth is, we're supposed to seek the truth. So I, if in, in a Christian Christianity list universe, I would be coming to you and saying, based on this intuition that that I have certainly, and I'm assuming because you're a human being, deep down inside you have it too. Yeah, you know, raping raping babies isn't isn't objectively good. You know that object, that seeking delusions to make you happy is not objectively good. If that's the case, then the only worldview that makes sense is a theistic worldview. So let's look around. I don't know. Maybe in that universe, I would be a Jew or probably a Jew. I read the God of the Bible. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but so I'd be saying same arguments, but pointing to that God. Well, you wouldn't be a Jew because Jew, Jew is, Judaism doesn't espouse hell, at least not free rabbinic. I, I don't know what they again, because different branches of belief. My, but, my belief is that we should seek the truth. Now, yeah. I'm not an utilitarian. I, I reject the idea that we should be terrified of. I uh, would oh, no, pick the worldview that avoids hell. That's not what I believe. I believe truth coincides with what God wants from us. For us, mm -hmm. so but I, so I'm making so me distinguish. I'm pointing out that your own professed utilitarianism, whatever you call it, you're not living it out. But I'm not telling you to live it out. I'm telling you to abandon that <laughs> and and realize that no, 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 that's a good point. Uh, it's, it's silly. It's ridiculous to believe there's no morality and that truth seeking is stupid. And so I should find a worldview that makes sense of that. And then in this universe we're actually in, I don't Christianity makes sense. Don't have, I, I believe we have morality. We have a, we have a moral sense. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Uh, I just don't believe it. It has, uh, I mean, just like we have the ability to, um, to, uh, to speak language and, but there's different languages in the world. We, you know, we, you know that, that instantiate themselves in different ways, but they all have nouns and verbs and, prepositions and, and such and they express sure. meaning so but in different languages different parts of the world the, those are instantiated in different ways 
in the same way, we have a moral sense that allows us to be outraged at certain things and to have a, a sense of indignation or, um, you know, anger or, or uh, moral um, um, compunctions, you know, whatever it is, guilt and all those things that go along with the moral sense. Uh, and that's, I think that's a, a definitely, I believe that exists and that's an evolved thing. But that, it's more than that. that. Like Pinker, you said you read Pinker and, you know, he points out that it's not just this vacuous category. Yeah, yeah. Right. No, there's a core morality. I think there's right. a core morality that he talks about it. Pro social in, in, in a lot of ways that, and that's how we, why we share uh, some of the same core morality with most, um, if not all, um, you know, people's uh, yeah. people groups in the world, but on uh, around the edges, there's obviously a lot of disagreement and there's contraventions of the, of the, of the standards within societies and between societies for sure. It's messy. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, I'm not a binary thinker that says that either, either morality has to be completely objective uh, or that it's, or that it doesn't exist at all. I mean, that's, that's a false. Uh, well, false the, the moral argument, all it depends on is objective categories of good and evil we could be completely agnostic about mm -hmm. what's in those categories mm -hmm. in other words i could say um there is a category of one and two now mm -hmm. i don't know how many or even an odd i don't know if they're an odd number of electrons or an even number i have literally no idea in the universe how many coke, cans of coke how many oranges out or even i don't know but all that is needed is there is a category of one or even and category of odd those exist Mm -hmm. Same way, right. if we could, we could be completely agnostic about is rape good or evil? I don't even know. I don't need murder. You know, I don't torturing babies. I don't know. But once you have those categories objectively, the moral mm -hmm. argument goes through. There's even one objective moral fact. What? Like, don't torture babies for fun. Well, that would be enough to, to make it all go through. Well, I mean, I think I think the those those moral that moral sense exists and it's and it's universal and some of those things are universal right but why uh, not there's then reasons there's reasons for it you know historically for uh you know for the uh better betterment of society that those that those exist that but those why not go nietzsche i mean go full full nietzsche and just be like those are the slave morality yeah of course because well, i, I choose wired. to live a life that i where i you know where i live with other people that have a moral sense also and they they respect it when i tell the truth and when i uh, live by the truth and when i um honor other people and help other people i i want to live in that society i want to get along with other people and i you know I, yeah sure i could take i could get certain selfish advantages sure. uh, for a time uh you know uh but is that the life I want to live? No, no, I don't. So, how it. would you answer the? Um, I posed those two thought experiments: the cipher's challenge and then the amorality pill. Where basically, and I pointed out, hey, you could do that. You say, well, you know, short term, sure, I could, you know, key my enemy's car and feel, nah, I got him, right? But long term, I feel guilty, and I mean, he might catch yeah. me. No, that yeah. was a good. That was a very, uh, very potent um, thought experiment uh, that I yeah. hadn't heard before. Um, I made I, it up. <laughs> that's why he hadn't so, heard of it. <laughs> yeah, cool. So, uh, but Morpheus is, I mean, I, 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 it's been a long time. I think I watched the movie once you know, yeah. right when it came out maybe, but uh, I, I don't recall the details, but anyway, so yeah, it's an interesting thought experiment. Um, I think the, I think the human, um, the human mind, once, once you commit yourself to living a certain uh, form of uh, existence where, mm -hmm. where you value have certain um commitments that you know i want to live this way i want to be mm -hmm. known as somebody who uh lives uh an, a, a, a praiseworthy not a blameworthy life mm -hmm. um then it becomes hard to imagine deviating from that i mean i think it's just a matter of like like c.s lewis talked about like you you build your life one small decision at a time you, you mm -hmm. keep going in a certain direction and that becomes who you are mm -hmm. so it's hard to even imagine um, deviating from that. I mean, objectively, I agree with you. It's, it's a difficult question because I mean, rationally, I should just take the, you know, um, that's it. Yeah. That's what I'm pressing into. I get, it's, it's, yeah. I'm trying to show you that you're necessarily living mm -hmm. irrational. I'm not being offensive. I'm trying to just, mm -hmm. I, I'm just to point out this all Francis Schaefer talked about taking the roof off. Yeah. Right. It, it's, it's human beings, uh, when we live at odds with reality, which, you know, as a Christian, I'm like, well, that reality is Christian. Mm -hmm. When we at, live at odds with it, 
there will inevitably be inconsistencies because it's like, you know, the guy who just is sure that gravity is not real. I can't, wait, why do I keep falling down? I don't get it. I don't just I keep banging into stuff. Why? It's, gravity is not real. Well, it is real. And you're going to bang into, I think someone said, you know, reality is what you bang into when you're wrong. Well, so, I mean, but yeah. the thing is that I, I think that, like I, like I mentioned, I, I agree that we have this structure, that this framework that mm. is is innate that uh and not only not only the capability of having shame and moral judgments and that sort of thing that is that's an innate um uh reality but also that some of the contents of it so you know certain things that you that that are inborn uh, within us that say hey you know you don't harm people unnecessarily i mean that's just that's but you can like transcend that. I mean, men mm -hmm. also want to have sex with lots of women, right? Yeah, yeah. We can yeah. transcend our innate urges. Exactly. Yeah. And so why not just value that go, go than for others. it? Nietzsche yeah. would be like, go for it. Stop being held back by these bourgeois norms and this oh, I mean, But I would have to give up the stability of the life I enjoy with my wife. So I, you know, that's just not who see, I am. And again, again I, I'm obviously not going to urge you to like, you know, practice little acts of infidelity, right? Yeah. But but my point is, again, I'm trying to show you, I'm obviously not telling you to do that, but I'm telling you, showing you that you're irrationally committed well, to a Christian I mean, life. Yeah, I, I don't have to do, I don't have to live the way I do, but yeah. I choose to. I mean, is that irrational to choose a certain, have a, have a path that I want to well, live in my life? When, when you say things irrational. like, I, when you say things like, as a rule, this kind of life makes me happy. And I'm like, well, well, right here, this one decision doesn't make you happy. And you do it anyway. Well, but it's, it's the rule. You're, you know, you're punting the weight of your own freedom. This is what the existential, you, you're, you're, you're afraid of being free. It's like that, man, the analogy in the book I have is the guy who says, I don't believe in gravity. And he's walking with his white knuckling the the edge of the the railing at the Grand Canyon. You're like, but you don't believe in gravity. I don't believe in gravity. Well, why are you gripping the railing? I just choose to. You're like, well, and I might be influenced by the upbringing that I had. Uh, to, again, you can transcend that though. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm sort of I'm pressing you, Ken. I know I'm doing that. Yeah, no, I'm it's good. I, I enjoy it. I mean, it's yeah. it's a good challenge. Because um, the I just don't think yeah. the word irrational. I mean, I. I, I think it's 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 beyond rational. It's 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 not a it's not a category of rational or or irrational. It's a category of what do I want to live? How do I want to live? Um, but take that example. Like if I asked you something like, uh, "Would you like a hundred dollars?" You'd be like, "Yeah, sh yeah, of course. Why not? Who wouldn't want a hundred dollars?" Like I have, yeah. And I say, "Look, uh, there's a, a bill on the street. Pick it up." And you're like, "Oh, well, that'd be stealing, wouldn't it?" I mean, I'm not going to tell on you. Well, I have this, I have this rule that I just don't steal. I'm like, well, you, you just told me you want a hundred dollars. You just told me morality is objective. You just told me you know, you're free to do anything you want. And so why don't you do it? And the and, and what I'm going to point out is there is a worldview that's consistent with your actual actions. You're fighting it. You're bumping into reality because it deep down and you know in the Bible Romans one God's law is written on our hearts. It's there. Well, I think and it's the core morality that evolved over. But uh, you can transcend that if you're, if you're, if an atheist, if you say, I'm a free agent, I can choose, but you keep not choosing. Well, Why? I mean, because I, I'm God's following, I'm following that core morality um, as well as some of the cultural. I mean, there's a mix. There's a cult, there's a cultural expectations that go beyond the core morality. And I, and I want to live in harmony with that. But you can transcend those. You well, have that freedom. To. I, I you don't, don't want to. Is that irrational? I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I because if I ask, if I ask you prior to, I remember this is like the what the the, um, the, uh, the cipher challenge was. Mm -hmm. If I say, "Do you want this?" You say yes, and I say, "Great, press this button." You say, "What does it do?" Mm -hmm. What? Why well, you? Do, but see, you would say, "Well, I just, I just, I just." You, you would have no rational reason. You just say, "I just don't want to." Yeah, but because it's ingrained. That's part of a core morality. But you can trans. It's not. There's no core morality. And Pinker would. Right, I, I say there is. I mean. No, 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 no. There's a core morality, but there's no core morality that says something like, um, thou shalt not, you know, press this button or thou shalt not inflict well, random harm on people in Africa. There's a, the core morality absolutely is, you know, my kin matters to me. My, mm -hmm. my community matters to me, mm -hmm. but CS Lewis pointed this out. There's no in, in, instinct I have to, uh, go help people, to go help people that I haven't strangers. I don't even see them invisible to me. Now, how do I know that? Because we don't. Right. 
Like you're not you're not out there you know, sending checks to random strangers in in Indonesia because you know. And I'm not saying we should or we should. I'm just saying that that's not part of our instinct. Right. <laughs> and yet, when I when I push you, then we'll do something evil to them. Oh, I can't do that. What? Well, well, I mean, well, you know, well, actually, Neil, your argument. Yeah. Go ahead. Ken does give checks to people. Oh yeah, no, I contributes to charity. Yeah, like what is it, ten or twenty percent of your income, Ken? Uh, it's like twenty five. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God! The life you can live, the the life you can save, the the Peter um, Peter Singer, Singer, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, this morality thing. This is why we never talk because it never comes to a conclusion. Yeah. But we can talk about something solid. Okay. You said that you believe there's ten percent chance Christianity could be true. No, so, you got you do. I whatever you say. I mean, I don't know. I was, I was using your number. Well, that's probably right, actually. Okay. I mean, because it's not like Mormonism, which, by the way, James is an expert on. Yeah. There's no chance. I mean, DNA, which convicts criminals, has <laughs> showed that Mormonism isn't true. Sure. So, but in Mormonism, Joseph Smith predicted in 1832 that Temple would be built in Independence, Missouri. You know, sure, 39 yeah, years yeah. later. Very oh, there's all kinds of, I know the evidence. I've listened to some yeah, Mormon. So yeah. He's a false prophet, but what you don't get is we had Dale Allison on mm. in his book, Resurrecting Jesus. He says, Jesus was wrong. Jesus is a false prophet. And he's a Christian. Yeah. So what do you say to that? Is that the Olivet Discourse? What are you pointing to as false prophecy? Yeah, the return in the gen- same generation. Yeah, yeah, I have a good article. Uh, actually, I it's based on Bart Ehrman's book, Jesus, Apocalyptic Prophet, the New Millennium. It's actually a good book. I have a long review of it. And he goes into the Olivet Discourse. And I point out that um, in when I went back and looked at the text carefully, I just I just like if I were a skeptic, an atheist, I would not think Jesus is clearly making a prediction of his imminent coming um, because I'll, I give I give, I have a whole essay on this. And uh, I feel like I actually had an atheist write to me recently and say, like, oh, basically be like, oh, yeah, you that's a good point. Basically, my argument is that if you look at the assuming Mark's gospel is the earliest, which is a very common assumption, if you look at assuming Mark's gospel is the earliest and later accounts change that, whatever you want to believe, that's, but say take Mark's gospel alone. If you look at the context of Jesus' Olivet Discourse, um, in the Olivet Discourse in Mark, they repeatedly, if you look at the whole like three chapters in the before and after the Olivet Discourse, it's very clear to me, at least, that Jesus is making a prediction about the fall of Jerusalem and the prediction of the second coming. And they're different. And let me get, if I get a whole essay on this, it's been a while, but let me give you one example. In the immediate teaching, that context, he says two things. First, he says, these things will happen after these signs happen. You can tell as soon as the signs happen, it's at the door, it's coming. I'm telling you in advance, you're going to know it's coming. So he says, like, he's bringing something that is going to happen at a certain time with signs. They should, disciples should know it's going to happen. Then he also, this, in the same passage, says, but watch out, be on your guard. If you knew when this were going to happen, you would prepare for it. Like, you know, the man who, the thief, if he knew, if the man knew when the thief was at the hour of the, hour of the night when the thief was going to come, he'd prepare for the thief. But because he doesn't know, he should always be on his guard. So you have two completely contrary uh, takeaways from Jesus. One is you ought to know in advance. I'm giving you predictions. The other is you have no idea when this is going to happen. Well, you're like, wait a minute. If he's referring to one single event, which is it, Jesus? Should we know or not know? And if you, again, there's many other things in that passage that indicate, again, I, I go through them in this essay. But my reading of that, which is, again, not my, it's like a very common interpretation is that he's referring first to the fall of Jerusalem, which was a cataclysm to the Jews. That was like the end of the world for the Jews. Then he's saying that's going to be the beginning of the end times. And is it retained? And the Bible's, it is clear. I would agree with this. The New Testament always views Jesus' second coming as imminent, meaning it's he's at the door. It's always the language. But at the same time, Jesus himself is constantly saying there's going to be a delay, a delay, a delay. In, in, in Mark's gospel, he says that. Don't be, don't get lazy. Don't, don't go to sleep. Don't, don't. And it's like, why would he say that if it's gonna, he's going to come within their lifetime in the midst of these signs? So anyway, if you want to see more about that, 
prophecy thing. The way that I at least here, here's the yep. thing, Neil. Go ahead. Yes, you you have the two top scholars in the world. Yeah. Uh, Dale Allison sure. and Barham and Bart said both of them came to the same conclusion yeah. in different ways that Jesus is best viewed as an apocalyptic prophet who no. had a week in the truth. So what I'm saying, these guys are the top in the field. And it's been since Albert Schweitzer, this has been the view, the best way to understand Jesus. So shouldn't you not lean on your own understanding and rely on the experts? Well, which, wait, what? Shouldn't I rely on my own understanding? You sh like the Bible, Bible says, don't rely on your own understanding, but go to the experts and scholarship. <laughs> that's, that's that's not what it says. <laughs> well, that's my interpretation. Yeah, right. Uh, so what I, what I would say is, um, you know, uh, I, I don't be yeah. So one thing is that C.S. Lewis himself thought that G Jesus got this prediction wrong. So it's mm. not just skeptics saying that oh he got this wrong, but even C.S. Lewis thought he got this wrong. Um, but I would just respectfully say, look at the text, read it. <laughs> All I can say well, is like, you think they read it? They know about Q. They know the Q sayings yeah. that are apocalyptic. It's just so clear. Oh, it's sorry. I, I know, do remember. Remember, Bill, when we when we had Dale Allison in, in our book club, he told us after dedicating his whole life to historical Jesus studies, he knows less now about <laughs> the historical Jesus than he did forty years ago. So let's not let's not forget that. I I wanted to switch gears just a little bit. Sure. I had other questions I wanted to ask first, but because the conversation is going this direction, I wanted to go kind of further down my list here. Sure, Neil. In chapter seven, you conclude that uh, rather whether true or false, it is not inherently irrational uh, to be convinced that Christianity is true. Sure, or you can say uh, that I said an atheist you, could you, say, yeah. My yeah, it was this kind of a summary of what you've yeah, done up mm -hmm. to that point in the book. But when you became a Christian in graduate school at Berkeley, uh, it was not primarily on philosophical or evidential grounds. Right. So well, my, my question is, what do you think were the primary factors? That, uh, and before I ask, I think that's true of, of me and a lot of Christians I know. Oh, yeah. Uh, we have reasons now, but we get the reasons after uh, and not before. So. What do you think were the primary factors that did influence your journey to Christianity? Sure. And let me point out what Bill said before, as you go into the average church and they have no idea about the historical Jesus, any of these issues you're talking about, they couldn't, they have no idea. Right. And so I think I say in that chapter, if I were an atheist, you know, I think I'd grant what Bill granted. Yeah. There is some pretty interesting evidence out there. I, you know, I'm not going to lie about it. Yeah. I fine tuning and the, the trilemma and the moral argument. That's okay. That's it's, so I would even grant that, but if I were a clever atheist, I wouldn't go there. I would just say, can you claim that Christianity is a rational faith when 90% of Christians today and throughout history have no idea about the evidence, right? It, it, clearly they're not, they're not basing their belief on evidence, at least the ones you presented so far. So, and that's, I agree. It's, that was my experience too. I did, now I, by the way, interestingly, I took John Gager's class, as a non-Christian, I took a class on New Testament Christian origins at Princeton, taught by John Gager. Believe it or not, um, what's her name? Uh, Elaine by the way, Neil, you were at Princeton. Where did you go wrong? I should have showed you the truth. Of well, the listen God, to you know? this. The, as a non-Christian, I took a class on New Testament Christian origins, taught by John Gager. Um, we used Bart Ehrman's textbook. And... Uh, one of our guest lectures was given by Elaine Pagels, the Gnostic oh, wow. gospel. I, so I had no idea at the time how famous she was, but she was just, oh, you know, Professor Gager's not here today. There's some woman lecturing us for two, you know, two classes. And it was Elaine Pagels. I had no idea. Wow. Anyway, so uh, I, I, I would say, to be fair to my former self, James, is that when I got to Berkeley, I believed in a God kind of like this vague deistic or theistic God. You got to tell loved everybody. I was, but I knew I, at that point I was not a Christian because I didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. I knew that was important for Christians. He did, I didn't believe he died for my sins. I, I wished I did, but I didn't. So I kind of knew I wasn't a Christian, but I did know on the other hand, I knew that Jesus uh, did exist because Bart Ehrman's very clear on that. John Gager believed it too. We actually went through the 12 basic facts about Jesus. He, you know, he was born in, uh, he lived in Judea. Uh, he had, a, he was baptized by John the Baptist. He probably had 12 disciples. He did hang out with Pharisees, the tax collectors and prostitutes. He was crucified. So all the basic stuff, they, they're like, yeah, everybody knows this. Um, 
So I knew that. And then what the what I was taught in class, at least, was that you know things like the resurrection, we can't really comment on that. This is Aaron's view. Aaron just says, as a historian, I can't say yay or nay. It's a miracle, you know. And I thought, yeah, it's like, you know, as, a, as an undergraduate, I was like, that's yeah, reasonable and it's a miracle. You, what can you say about it? But to me, then, as a non-Christian again, I was like, well, that's a matter of faith, I guess. So then I got to Berkeley, began going to church with my future wife Christina, and that's where I became a Christian. But one of, the, but I did have this rounding in fact. In other words, I did say, hey, Jesus existed. He died on the cross, and then he might have risen from the dead, historically. And I'm, I'm open to that. So I wasn't just flying in the middle of nowhere here. Hey, so but that said, what brought me to faith? And so I think for me, uh, the, the answer was primarily, well, again, through knowing my wife, reading C.S. Lewis, and then going to church, but that came down to this. I was super proud of being intellectual. That was my thing. My thing was I was super smart. I was going to go become a tenured professor of theoretical chemistry at some awesome school. I was going to write books and papers and win awards and everyone looked up to me. That was my, that was who I was. I was smart. And then when I began to suspect the Christian name, just, it might be true. It might be true. That would mean admitting that I had been wrong my entire life and that these stupid rednecks with their Jesus bumper stickers, <laughs> They knew more than I did about God, the God of the universe. He'd revealed himself to little children and not to Neil Shenfield. How dare he? If I was going to enter the kingdom, I was going to have to become like a little child and be led by the hand. And that troubled me. And so, so the, the night, but, but, I, but I started thinking, but what if it's true? I mean, I, cause I'd read enough C.S. Lewis and I realized this is a sensible thinker. And I believe in God of some kind. And I kind of knew, you know, Neil, you're kind of a jerk when you think about it, right? You're actually not, you don't have it all together, morally speaking. So if there's a God, you need forgiveness. And I was kind of like, yeah, 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 God will forgive, right? God will forgive. He's God. It's his job. This is, you know, c'est son maître, which is, uh, that was Voltaire, but this is his trade. But when I went to church, they're like, but God, yes, God will forgive you. And this is how he did it. He had to send his son to die for you. That is the way he forgives. And then I was, then I was like, wait a minute. If that's true, that's troubling. I, I was basically, it's like, if you claim, you claim to be so humble, oh, you know, you're a sinner, you need forgiveness. And now God's offering it. Are you going to accept it or not? That's what it came down to. And it came down to me saying, a man, and I, uh, literally, this is why I said, this is my conversion prayer. This is the walk the other day. I was in my apartment um, and I was, just, I was talking to my future wife, just weeping because I was like, this doesn't make, I don't like this. There's hell, God's wrath. I don't like these things about Christianity. What if it's, how can it be true? And she actually said, yeah, I don't even, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. And I was shocked because to me, if you're a Christian, you have all the answers. You, know, you just believe what they tell you. And you should have all the answers. But when she said, I don't have all the answers in retrospect, it's because she's dealing with a real God, not one she invented. If you invent a God, you build a bear, you have all the answers. Anyway, so I came down, I came down to it. And this is my, this is my sinner's prayer. This is God. I don't know if Jesus is your son, but if he is, I'll follow him. That was it. And I think that was the moment I became a Christian. I mean, talk about mustard seed faith. I don't, I got, I don't even, it's like this. As for whether this man's a sinner, I know not. I know one thing. I once was blind, now I see. That's the, I'm, I'm venturing the minimal, it's a minimal facts faith. You know, I know I was blind. I know I now see. That's all I know. And that, but that was the moment I think I was born again. And, but it, but it came, it came because basically God comes to me and says, you know, you're a sinner. I'm like, yes. So you know, you need forgiveness. Yes. And I'm telling you, Jesus is the way to receive that forgiveness. And you have the audacity to say, no, thank you. It costs your son's life, but no, thank you. Like, I don't have the right to do that. And again, I wasn't saying, well, I'm, I believe, I, I, I was just saying, okay, I get that. If it's true, I will follow. And that, and that you know, I had a long way to go, but that's basically what it came down to. Now, the issue is, and, and I think, James, you'd probably agree with this. 
That's how more or less all Christians become Christians. At some point, they're wrestling with a moral argument, they're wrestling with the fine tuning, the trilemma, the resurrection evidence, whatever it is. But it comes down to this. They it ask. This kind of gets back back to that my question. Yeah. Um, and we, we a couple of years ago we had a little bit of discussion on this, but uh, uh, you, you know, the, uh, I, I re- re- react somewhat like Bill does. You mm-hmm. know, if you're a Christian, you should have you should have answers. You should know this stuff. And uh, but when I first became a Christian, I didn't. And yeah. and some lived there. And, and uh, Bill Craig one time said, you know, most people don't have uh, reasons, and that's absolutely okay. And I say, well, <laughs> most people don't have reasons. That's not okay. You you got to have reasons. And, and it kind of gets back to what we talked about a couple of years ago in the book club. I don't remember the author or what, what the book was, but, you know, are non-believers really our, our epistemic peers, mm-hmm. you know, because we have, you know, this spiritual belief, which is not, not just more than emotional. There, there's something we believe that did actually happen spiritually to be born sure. again. And now we also have this evidence, but we only we only talk about this this part of the equation because that's, right. that's really all we have in common. We we both unbelievers and believers can talk about evidence, but I can't take this part out of me and say experience sure. this, and you may look at the evidence differently. So, are we epistemic peers? Yeah, I would say no. I mean, this is where theology comes in. It's like, I, I mean, outside of Christ, we're dead men walking. We all well, are. We all want. By, by the way, Neil, I listened to you and uh, Dan talk about what horrible sinners you were. Yeah, <laughs> you guys were just terrible. <laughs> uh, Joel Osteen says that ninety nine point nine percent of people are good. Yeah. Jesse Duplantis goes to heaven and talks to Jesus like we go to the grocery store. Sure. So, by the way, James, when he. Uh, almost died. They said, you could write a million dollar bestseller. And he said, no, I didn't go to him. He was being honest. But what I'm saying, you have a certain Christianity Mm. and now TBN is broadcasting their heresy throughout the world. This prosperity gospel is their type of Christian. I met a girl on a cruise ship and she had Joel Osteen's book and she goes, this is my Christianity. And I went, Joel Osteen? Are you kidding me? He's a heretic. Mm. So what I'm saying, how do you see this is just a little sliver of Christianity you have? So two things I'd say. One is that, again, I, I, I mean, I think you would agree with this, that the Bible, you read the Bible, you don't get Joel Osteen theology. You just don't. I I absolutely agree. What, and I, you might disagree with this deck statement, though. But 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 if you agree that at least there are things the Bible does not teach, the Bible does not teach, you know, Joel Easton Christianity. Okay. Well, I would go farther. The Bible also does teach some things, and one thing it teaches us is that we're sinners. Yes. That's yeah. right. Well, Sorry, I mean, good, good. All right, <laughs> we got we got some agreement. The T of Tulip, obviously. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So this is where. Okay. So let me make two arguments. One is that. I do believe the Bible teaches total depravity. And I know that. So that's one thing. So if I read the Bible, I'm like, look, it's just there in the Bible. But if I'm honest, it's not. It, okay, Experientially, the Bible did come first. The Bible and, and reading the Bible and being taught from the Bible. It's like, oh, because I was like, I was like, no, I, I, I'm a sinner. I, I grant that. I became a Christian by saying I'm a sinner. Sure. Right. But at some point, I was still was like, oh, well, I'm not as I'm not a, a, a wretch, a vile worm, you know, this kind of stuff. Like, I, I wouldn't say that about me. Oh, how naive I was. Now, yeah, to right? you, not when I listen to you and Dan, you guys. Yeah, you know. I think that so. So growing in and we talked about, you know, the contradiction between your objectively, you know, it's not like, well, who have you murdered lately? Gosh, Neil, what is wrong with you? Well, no, at, from the outside, I, I don't probably don't look that much different. I probably look better than most people. Let's be honest. I look yeah. better, but I know my heart. I'm seeing myself from the inside. And, and worse than that, God sees me deeper than I do. So there's one aspect is that the more I read the Bible, the more I see this chasm that the Bible assumes between God and man. It's vast. 
But then experientially, and this is where I, I would say this is where the, the, the final section of the book comes in. Ken, you said, what if Christianity didn't exist? There's no Christianity at all. So you're in a universe with all, but there's no Christianity at all. What would you believe? I would believe God is there. There's a, a good God, a God who cares about the truth, right? But I also believe this. I need the gospel. Me, meaning I wouldn't, I wouldn't have heard of the gospel, but I, I think that if I were as I am, but no Christianity, but I had just that self-reflection and thought about who are you really, really? I would wish the, there were a gospel to believe. I would be approaching. And then, by the way, it's just interesting. My, my father-in-law works for Wycliffe. You might not actually know him, Ken. His name's Rick Brown. He's apparently pretty well-known in Wycliffe. Um, but he talks, and this is very common in Muslim countries, but he'll occasionally meet Muslims who are just desperate. They are, they're killing them, not killing themselves, but they are just neurotic almost because they are terrified of God because they re, but, but not in a, not in a bad way necessarily. They realize that he is good and holy. They've been taught that their whole lives. But then they're also beginning to see that they are filthy. I actually had a, I heard a story from a missionary, a doctor, who said he was operating on a Muslim woman and he was showing her in some you know remote village. But he was a surgeon, so he was taking the, the scalpels and he was dipping them in you know alcohol to sterilize them. And she said, what are you doing? And he said, well, see, I'm taking these instruments and I'm dipping them in alcohol to clean them so they'll be pure so that when I operate on you, you won't, I won't get contaminated. And she actually said, and this is his story he's telling, but he said, she said to him, how I wish there was something like that for my heart. That plaintive longing to be pure. It's not, and it's funny thing is, in our, uh, this is in our, my new book, but it's, it's totally about different stuff, critical theory, not about Christianity really, but about critical theory. But that longing in the heart, the knowledge in the human heart mm. that we are somehow wrong. There's something wrong with us. Not just out there. We want to make it out all out there. It's the system is wrong. But people have these feelings of guilt and shame, and they don't know what to do with them anymore. They used to be able to go to the go to the priest, go to the, the pastor, get prayed over, hear the gospel, but now they've got nothing. So there, so but the, it's, it's like but there's this deep void that they're trying to fill with all kinds of stuff. You know, maybe drugs or alcohol or sex, maybe just like spiritual disciplines and meditation, maybe activism and politics. Who knows? You know, MAGA Trump, you know, when the Messiah yeah. is going to save us. Who knows what it is? But deep down inside, there's this there's this void. They're trying to fill that. And, and so that what I would say is that's really what happens to Christians is that they come to realize and that we grow in our knowledge that, man, God is really that good and loving. But in comparison, man, oh, man, right. I need well, a you, rescue. Yeah. So do you believe in the L? Yeah, are, are you a Calvinist? Sorry, which one? Which one? Bill, I'm a, yes, I'm a Calvinist. That's easy. Well, you know, it's funny. Most of the really educated, sophisticated Christians are Calvinists. So. I mean, it varies. And I, you know, if you read my book, right? So I don't make it. You could probably intuit it from my book, but I don't make a huge deal of it either. Well, no, that's fine. Uh, yeah. Do you believe in I guess you believe in the P perseverance of the saints. So you would say me and Ken were never really Christians, right? Preservation of the saints. Okay. And uh, yeah. And, and I would say that, uh, although I also do believe that, you know, sometimes people wander for a long time, even if they say, well, I don't believe anymore, but there is that spark of faith in them. So if I, you know, talking to you personally, if you say, well, I'm not a Christian, I'd say, okay, I believe you. <laughs> no, that's not true. I know that you're one of the elect. I don't know that. Who knows? Uh, but I so, mean, with me, I never did much in Christianity. I wasn't a big star like Ken, who, you know, everybody goes, don't send me to Africa. God, don't. And Ken <laughs> said, send me to the hottest part of Africa. So yeah. what I'm saying is we had Dan Barker here years ago. Yeah. And I asked that question, was he ever really a Christian? Yeah. And he said, man, if I wasn't a Christian, nobody was a Christian. Yeah. He was trying to convert Catholics in Mexico. If you know that Catholics aren't Christian, it puts you on a higher level, mm. just like Calvinists being the highest level. <laughs> right? We're the lowest level. Do you listen to our theology? What's yeah. the T stand for? Neil, do you, yeah. Neil, do you, do you know uh, Tom Rodelius? I don't think so. 
Okay, he's a string theorist. Yeah. Um, and I interviewed him a couple of years ago, and to your point a minute ago about depravity, I know yeah. we talked about it on the podcast, but Tom told me his conversion story, which is very similar in some sense. His conversion story, you know, you make the argument in the book that uh, we have justified true belief because Christianity meets a couple of our needs, and one yeah. of them is that we salvation from our depravity, right? We're yeah. depraved and we need to be saved. Tom was actually interviewing for a job, wasn't a Christian. His brother was, and was talking to him about Christianity at the time. But Tom was getting a job interview, and he had to take a lie detector test. Mm. And Tom's Tom has a similar thought process, really smart like, like yourself in terms of the physics and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he failed the lie detector test. <laughs> And uh, it scared the crud out of him. Mm -hmm. And so he tells the story about how he just started confessing every wrong that he could think mm -hmm. of because he really wanted the job. Right. But it was basically a moment where he realized, I'm not the nice guy that I thought I was. My gosh, look at all the junk <laughs> in my past. Um, and that's how God started his Christian faith. And uh, just very, it was a very, I mean, he, his brother led him to Christ eventually, but uh, very much the same kind of conviction. Some For some people, it happens instantly almost. For yeah. others, it, <laughs> excuse me, it takes a long time. But that essence of, we talked about it already on the, on the podcast, the essence of recognizing the depth of your own depravity and what it cost God. And I like what you said a minute ago about the fact that we hide from, because as sinful human beings, we forget about the problem of evil. The problem for us is God's goodness. It's so yeah. fantastic compared to our wretchedness that we hide from from what is good. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that story. Tom Redelius, if you look him up, Tom Redelius, string theorist, fantastic testimony about what you're mm -hmm. talking about. Just, I've thrown it in there. I find that the conversation that, or this whole topic fascinating because I find find myself somewhere in between everyone. I mean, you have humanists who perhaps deny or minimize the the depravity of of human nature, or think there's a blank slate or whatever. Um, and so, I, I like I said, I side with Steven Pinker that we are that we are flawed, and there's innate, um, you know, just basically um, blind spots that we all have. Um, so I acknowledge that on the one hand. Uh, and on the other hand, I, it seems to be just extreme to the kind of the language that's used in in this the 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 binary. It seems like binary thinking. Either either you're pure as the driven snow, or you're totally. I mean, you you're 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 the de you're the you're the devil from the pit of hell. You mm -hmm. know, there's nothing in between. It seems that's that's just not reality. I mean, there, there's some people that are just worse than others. They're committing, um, you know, murders and, and mayhem and, and other people living upstanding lives while they're being flawed for sure. But I think the danger of this, this con this binary thinking is that it, it kind of makes everything the same as anything else. It's like, if I, if I lust in my heart, you know, I, I might as well be committing, you know, adultery with, with the nearest prostitute that I can find, you know, the, you know, that the, there's no difference. So I might as well just go be a prostitute or, you know, visit with a prostitute, you know, so it's there, there's gradations, right? I mean, it's not, to, I mean, I, I don't believe in totally proud. Maybe there's some people who are close to that, but, and there's some people who are close to being, you know, white as the driven snow and perhaps, but probably somewhere halfway in between. And, you know, the, and we're all flawed. So I can acknowledge both, but, just my goodness, you know, the idea that we're, you know, from the, you know, the devil from the pit of hell, just, that just, it doesn't. I think, it, Ken, it's a matter of your, reality. I think, Ken, it's a matter, of, I speak for myself, but I think it's a matter of looking horizontally. At yeah, yeah, people. I was going to say, if you get God in the picture, yes, you can, you can exacerbate, you can make that, you can, you can make it dramatic, but if it, if God's not in the picture, yes. You know, then we're all then we have a we have a grayscale of of yeah yeah right and yeah, wrong. It's not binary. You're, you're, it's a scale. You're a little bit yeah. You're a little bit more moral than I am, and that kind of thing. And mm. then we get into that uh, the 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 parable in the in the gospels um, with the uh, 
the tax collector and yeah. uh, the, the the other guy that says, I thank you, God, that I'm not like that guy. And, uh, you know, in our brains, yeah, we're all I'm going, not, I think that's not I'm what not I'm saying. advocating. I'm just saying objectively, there's some people that cause more harm in this world than others. You know, yeah, is, is may, that not maybe. Yeah, maybe Neil can address that, Ken. Uh, I, I, in my mind, you know, total depravity is, doesn't really mean I couldn't be worse if I tried. Yeah. I'm sure I could be worse. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to me, it means that even on my best day and my best actions, my best motives are not as pure as, as I would like them to be. And when compared to God, yeah, I'm... Um, um, the total depravity and and uh, as far as the penalty it's the book of james in the bible says that if you offend the law at one point you're guilty of all and that doesn't seem fair to me i thought well I, you know if there's 613 commandments i didn't break all of them i only broke a couple of hundred of them and so but if you think of the law as like a plate not a plate glass window uh or, or not like um a, a window with 613 panes in and I only broke some of those panes but if you think of it as a plate glass window you either offended the law or you didn't you're either a sinner or you're not so in a sense the the penalty for sin uh would be the same whether you whether you do one or a million and mm -hmm. and yeah, even on my best day more. I don't know yeah, what I'm do you just, think about that Neil well I was gonna say a couple of clarifications one is that I know evangelicals have this quip that all sins are equal but they're not the Bible talks about lesser and greater sins all the time. So no one thinks that like, you know, they're qualitatively equal. That's true. They're all damnable, but they're not quantitatively equal. There's some sense in which people will be punished more severely for certain sins uh, and, and for the gravity. They did the whole Westminster Confession talks about this. It's not like, a, again, this is, this is not Neil's interpretation. This is like the standard Protestant theology. Um, and then also distinguish between total depravity and utter depravity. Total depravity says that every part of us is tainted. That's what it says. There's no, so the ca Catholic belief was that like, our reason's not tainted though. But Protestant said, no, every part of us is tainted. Utter depravity, in contrast, says every part of you is tainted as badly as it could be. That's not true. By God, that's not even remotely true. God's grace restrains us from being as bad as we could all the time. God's grace is lavishly poured out on us. I mean, C.S. Lewis, I think, helpfully talked about us being mirrors. We were meant to mirror God's goodness. Like he shines his love onto us. We shine it back onto him and other people, right? But now we are broken, stained mirrors, but we're not not mirrors. We still reflect God's goodness, but we mar it. We we we, we damage it. It's, it's all, every part of our actions and our thoughts is tainted. And in terms of Ken saying, well, but why so binary? Again, if once you bring God into it, well, that's partly why. <laughs> I agree that... On this level, yeah, I'm not out there see a serial I'm just killer. saying I don't feel that. I feel like an outsider in that discussion. It just, I, I don't feel the weight of that to myself. So one way, I think I had this experiment and it's based on a Francis Schaeffer illustration, but uh, I used that, you know, an I, I use in the book, the iPhone app, you know, you have an app on your phone that reads your mind. I think I had that in the book, right? When it just broadcasts your thoughts all day. Mm -hmm. And, or, or and, and for those who are we're all guys here, I think in the room right now. But you know, we're, or if you're married, but all of us struggle with lustful thoughts, or at least we have. Maybe you're you're old enough that you stop. But you know, <laughs> when you were when you were young, I, I'm sure you struggled all the time with lustful thoughts, right? And you're like, yeah, but that's just human. That's just human nature. I get that. I get that human nature. I'm not saying it's good, but here's the thing: imagine you walk in the, your house one day. And your wife's watching television. You're like, what are you watching? She's like, someone sent this. And you look and it's with horror. It's a DVD replaying every lustful thought you've ever had throughout your entire life. And you're like, there are like 20 DVDs, 80 DVDs. And she's just sitting there watching them. And she, what is, what is, she's weeping, right? Think about the times in your life when your kids have been just utterly disappointed in you. Just like you made them cry for whatever reason. Now, and and you're like, well, but but we're all human. I, well, that's if humans react that way, and we feel the shame. We're like, what is wrong with me? And that's when other humans are exposed to what happens to this all the time. Even as a in a horizontal scale, I ought to be horrified by what's in me. Now, again, I ought to be horrified by what's in everybody. I'm not saying we're, but I'm just saying, yeah, I think when we're really honest about our hearts and again not our behavior we can look good on the outside 
but our hearts, Jesus always pointed to the heart and then take that and then put it in, not in the light of what other people might think, but in what of God thinks of us. Another last thing I'll say is this, you know, James, you said, you know, there's 613 commands in the Torah and, you know, they're little ones, they're big ones. Jesus talks about the lesser matters, the greater matters. The rabbis did that too. Um, one thing Charles Spurgeon said is that, you know, he said, you know, God's law is so strict, you know, you break this little tiny command and the, you know, punishment is so severe seemingly. And he says, well, there are a couple of considerations there. One is it's not about the size of the command, but the size of the, the, the law giver. The law was small. The law giver was big. So if I say to, you know, my son, Hey, can you just, uh, can you make sure to pick up your room? I, I really, I order this. Uh, you know, I have a big interview coming up. It's really important. I need to make sure it's quiet. So just, I'm just asking you for five minutes. Just be quiet. Daddy. It's really important, daddy. And then after a minute, he comes and just banging on the door, banging on the door, yelling and screaming and shrieking. And then afterwards, I'm like, you know, what did you just do? I was live. And he's like, well, it's just, I just banged on the door. I do that all the time. It's a big deal. I'm like, it's a big deal because it meant something to your father. Don't you? Don't you? And he's like, I don't really care what you think. I'm like, wait, wait, you don't care that I asked you? You don't care that it hurt me? He's like, no. Well, when we break a little command that God's given us, it's like, the, who do you think God is? You don't love him enough? Then Spurgeon also said, the littler the command, think how easy it would have been to keep it. Right. So when I break a, a, some really hard, big command, it's like, well, it was a hard command to keep, right? But if I break a little command that was too easy to keep, that makes it actually worse. Why am I doing it? Because I don't really care. It's like, it's a little, ca who cares? It's what well, with so little effort, I could have pleased my creator and I chose not to. What does that say about me? My priorities. So anyway, there are all these ways to see, I think that, um, I think what was I saying in the book, and this is, you know, me as a Christian Calvinist talking. If we spent an hour alone in our rooms with our own thoughts and we're honest, we'd be desperate for the gospel. But the reality is, Romans 1, we suppress the truth about ourselves. We don't want to know the truth about ourselves, right? We hide it from ourselves. And, you know, God, I think, last thing I'll say, God in his mercy lets us go through times when it's unavoidable. When we screw up so badly, we become so ashamed of ourselves. That's God's mercy that he lets us see our own hearts. And God forbid that he ever withholds that from us. It's his grace that says, I mean, I mean the hymn, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." They, by we'll the skip way, over that, yeah. By the way, Neil, uh, yep. James just spoke to 15,000 people. It's one of his favorite sermons. Oh, yeah. Romans 1, that we suppress the truth right. that we're actively suppressing. But you look at Ken Daniels, he tried, he he wrestled with this. He read Christian books for six months, He, but he read the other side. So how is he suppressing the truth when he's reading both sides? Well, the one truth I'd say is clearly, I mean, in his own admission, if this statement is true, he's suppressing it. He's wretched, a wretched sinner. It's like, oh, I don't believe that about myself. Well, if it's true, then he's suppressing the truth. I mean, he's admitted he doesn't believe that. But, and I would just say, you know, if I were, uh, if I knew him better uh, and had the, you know, the relational capital, I would go to him and say, let's just talk about your day. To walk me through every thought you had just today, just today. Walk me through what's the worst thing you did ever in your whole life? And who knows about that? Or I, mean, I, I, I clearly don't have the, you know, I don't even know Kent. But, and ultimately I do think that it comes down to God having to take off or you know, pry our hands off of our rationalizations. You know, one thing I also say is, uh, you know, we sometimes, um, think of, you know, as a Calvinist, you know, when God regenerates us, uh, he, you know, he gives that, and this is actually a way to talk, sometimes Calvinists talk, is if, you know, we were, um, you know, we're given a, a new, uh, a, a new real, realization that God exists, you know, we're, we're given new evidence that God exists, we're given an, an, uh, what Calvin called the census divinatus, divinitatis, uh, that humans have, we just, and it's, you know, it's, re it, God reveals himself to us and we're suddenly aware of him. The Holy Spirit epistemology, Dr. Craig talks about, but what I argue in the book, it's, it's implicit is this, what if rather than God giving us 
an awareness of his presence that we didn't have before. God removed, takes, pries our hands away from our eyes because they were we were we were doing this the entire time. We we were refusing to admit the truth. And God in love pulls our hands back and says, please admit the truth. And we do. So I rather than saying it's not he's adding something to us, he's taking away something from us, which is our rationalizations and our denial. Um, and so again, well, I wouldn't. Well, I would say just theologically, I'm not passing judgment on Ken as a person. I'm passing judgment on humans. Humans are blinded to their sin deliberately, you know, with full volition. They they want to be blind. And that's why God has to come in and, and remove well, and that. As a Calvinist, yeah. you would say we're graveyard dead. Nothing about us wants to reach toward God. And in the Bible, yeah. it says something like there's no good things and whatever. Right. But we just at the beginning said about the Syrophoenician woman, she was reaching to Jesus and Jesus ah. responded. So does that doesn't that seem that you can reach toward God and he can respond? And not yet. So the Calvinists would absolutely affirm you can reach towards God. Why? Because God reached towards you. God puts his Holy Spirit into people, regenerates them so that they reach out to him. So when, and in the Bible, it talks about that God opened her heart, Lydia's heart, to believe the gospel. God opened someone's heart to receive the words of the apostles. So God is the actor who first plants the seeds of faith, plants that desire to know him, and then meets them with the gospel. That so it's it's not it's not so I, I'm same thing with free will. Are we free? Absolutely. But who enables us to make those free choices? Well, God. Does. I mean, obviously, by creating us in the first place, for example. I mean, everyone would agree with that. But uh, it's always that God is the one who acts. Uh, okay, we'll go monergistically in our hearts to enlighten us, and then we respond by seeking Him. That's the order. Um, I, I'm, I'm speaking to Calvin. Woman. He yeah. wasn't reaching toward her or regenerate. He was rejecting her. Oh, no, no. But why Why would think about this? is interesting. How, why would she even go to Jesus? There are plenty of people who are like, yeah, yeah, some some guy. I don't, want, who, I don't believe in him. So there's some spark of faith. And actually, he says that your faith is great. So there was faith in her. And the question is, well, where did that faith come from? Now, an Armenian would say, well, she just had it in herself. She, she, you know, she just had faith in her heart. Maybe she was a little bit, whatever, more humble. Uh, maybe she had a greater need. But Calvinists would just say the same thing. They say, yeah, there's faith in her heart, but God put it there. That's all. God was the one who put that faith, and then she was the one, and then and, and that's why she sought Jesus. So they, again, this is the, I know, if you read the book, I don't talk about this all the time. I'm not like a, one of these persons who's nothing but Calvin all the time. Oh, and they're, they're there, believe me. No, I know. I, the, I get it. I get it. But I, there's a cerebral aspect that is being talked about, like the sin and having to, uh, you know, just talking about the depth of sin and how how bad it is and, and everything and and i i track with all of that intellectually yeah experientially yeah i know i know that i fall short of my own standards my own right. aspirations and the, and the expectations of those around me just today uh somebody at work pointed out something about me that i had not thought of that i had you know uh he basically said, well, Ken, you, you talk too much, you share too much uh, things that are should be private or whatever. Mm. And I reflected on it as like I felt I felt a sense of guilt and maybe shame. Uh, and so I went back to him later and I, um, you know, and I, I I searched my my mind and my my memory to think of things that I had said. And I remembered one or two things and and, and I and I um, put it into chat GPT and I said, uh, you know, make an apology uh, <laughs> With this framework, you know, and it was this nice long little thing, and I sent it to him, and then he said, "Thanks for the, you know, thanks for the." Uh, hey, by the way, Neil, uh, we had a girl at the book club, and she goes, "Ken Daniels, I read your book, and now I'm not a Christian. I'm deconverted." Hmm. Ken said, "Oh, great, another millstone around my neck." Yeah, uh, is that what I said? Oh, I by the way, it'd be it. great for you guys to but, come but back. Anyway, and all I to say, I, I do feel, I do feel the weight of that at a human, at a horizontal level, right? But do I go through life feeling like this, um, you know, like a worm for being, uh, you know, totally depraved in any Calvinist sense or any any um, vertical sense? No, it doesn't. It doesn't weigh me down on that level. I, I don't feel that same weight that you're talking about. Um, I, it's not that I don't feel a weight at all. 
it's just not to that extent. Of course. I mean, that makes sense. If you don't believe in God, then there's not, it's like the, 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 the weight's crushing you from here, but not from, you know, a thousand miles up, which it would be if, if you can make God. people, if you can convince people that they, that the weight is even more serious than it really is, then you, it's like, it's like giving somebody a disease and then having a, having a pill to give to them and then to entice them to take that pill. You know, it's right. like, well, uh, <clears throat> or I would, but I would say, okay, that's, that's one possibility, but the other possibility. So you're saying, you know, this is a great story that Christians invent to make their religion more compelling. That's, Okay, that's one way to see it's a, it. It's a possibility. I'm not saying yeah. necessarily that's no, no, no. But I, I, I get it. But, but here's the other possibility. The, the other side of it: if Christianity is false, okay, well, this is just one more adaptive mechanism. This is what you know Daniel Dennett talks about. This is an adaptive mechanism to make this religion succeed because it's compelling because it threatens you with hell. Okay, if if Christianity is false, that's one interpretation. If Christianity is true. Well, it looks different then. But it looks, but that that it, then then the implications yeah. are. Well, this is exactly why we don't want to believe in God. This is exactly why we are content with a totally inconsistent worldview and hiding from these contradictions and avoiding our freedom. Because once we admit, well, what if God exists? Suddenly that little weight becomes this crushing thousand mile millstone. Well, it's still, so now you can the see, question yeah. to be resolved is which one, which narrative is true. I mean, that's, that's what we need to get back to. Right. So, trying to trying to push this the the guilt mechanism uh, you know first let's i i you know three-fourths of your book was first about like the the intellectual reasons for believing um you know if you could convince me in the, that three-fourths then maybe that the final one will have some weight but and if it didn't work to get me in that three-fourths of the way you know, where you're talking about intellectual reasons for believing, mm. then um then the rest seems like a hammer you know it's it it, it, it could be that it's true you right maybe everything you've you've tried to convince us of is true let's say that's true then you're justified in bringing that hammer but uh on the other hand if it's not true then it feels just like a, a, a manipulative um, well so remember i framed that last argument as a deductive argument so there were premises and inclusive so it's still, it's still intellectual but mm -hmm. what you're denying is premise two and three premise one no premise three and four so premise three and four were that you are moral failure and you, you need a savior uh right so well, the three is i'm a moral failure I, I can go along with that okay Absolutely. you know it is, it, 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 I mean, the language the choice of language could be you know talked about but yeah i i, I believe that we we fall short in of, of our own standards and other right. those around us. So I don't deny that. I think, well, I think that, well, I think that the phrase I use is radical moral savior, a radical moral failure. And then the last one, the need a savior. But the, the point is, it's not, so it's not really a hammer because what you're, what I'm saying is that's a logical argument. Mm -hmm. But what you're, and I actually argue, you know, historically, psychologically with evidence for three and four, philosophically for three and four. But what I really point out, and this is, I absolutely affirm this, you know, I think three and four are ultimately existential premises. You either are aware of them existentially or you're not. So, and so I, an atheist, you said to me, well, I just don't existentially feel this crushing weight of guilt. Yeah, I, you know, I kind of, this would have been me when I, for a Christian in 2000 or in 1999. I would have said, yeah, I kind of mess up sometimes. I, I try, but I try, I try, but you know, I fail. We all do. And, but I, you know, I need a savior. Well, I need forgiveness, but God will give it. But when those premises become, again, weights, when you feel their weight, that's when the argument suddenly becomes really pertinent. So I, and I, if atheist just came to me and said, well, I just denied premise three and four. I said, well, here's the evidence, but I agree with you, actually. Ultimately, that those two premises, and I make this point in my talks. That's why people become Christians, because those intellectual arguments, they might even, they might even, like you said, they might say, well, yeah, I can see intellectually why I'm a moral failure. And I can see intellectually why I need like an external forgive forgiveness. I kind of get that. But until those two premises become these like weights, well, the argument kind of, you know, well, okay. By the way, Neil, have you heard yeah. of Ray Comfort? He'll go and say to someone off the street, have you ever told a lie? And yeah, you're right. Have you ever stole? Well, yeah, kind of stole something. Yeah. Have you ever 
lusted in your heart for a woman. He goes, well, yeah. And he goes, well, by your own admission, you're a lion stealing like, adulterer. That's right. He's a crap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they go, oh, my God, I didn't know that. I, 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 I accept oh, Jesus. Like, get me out right. of this. But I, again, if, if that's a, more sophisticated. Yeah. That, yeah, no. And, and, but, but I unapologetically, amen to Ray Comfort. I mean, that's. Oh. That that's what I would say is the essence of the gospel. And until I mean, I mean, and again, this is not new. Paul talked about that the gospel is foolishness to Greeks. It's just nonsense. What is this? Oh, you have sin in your heart, and you need a crucified Jew to come and who rose from the dead. What are you talking about? This is nonsense, right? He knew that. This is the foolishness that was preached, but he said, this is the power of God to salvation for those who believe. It just is. And I'm not saying that it's an, it's a rational deductive argument, right? I'm just, I'm not just threatening you. It's, it makes sense rationally, but well, I, I mean, also I, agree. I, th yeah. I think it's time for us non-believers to take back the idea of, of human uh, depravity uh, because I mean, that, it's our birthright as, as believers in evolution to, to think that, you know, we are going to be flawed. We're going to be selfish. We're going to be out for number one. That's mm -hmm. that's not hard to explain. What's hard to explain is why we do anything altruistically. You know, that's the harder mm -hmm. thing for me to explain. It's not hard for me to explain how everybody's depraved, um, you know, given evolution. You know, Neil, it's it's interesting, Neil. You talk about the the existential aspect of that argument and mm -hmm. it's not going to impact you until you feel that angst. And uh, I had to read uh, Camus in grad school a couple of years ago and yeah. uh, the stranger. And oh yeah. Saw, Great book. You know, and, and it seems to me when you, when you suppress the existential angst, you get the sort of bland existence of yep. my soul where, where nothing tastes, nothing tastes. I, I could kill somebody. I could go sit at mama's funeral. I can go have a cigarette with my girlfriend it's all the same. Yeah. But then at the end of the novel, as you know, he throttles, he's, he's screaming at a priest. Yeah. And just, he's just this rage. Like he can't take the sameness of, of everything. And he has to, ha he has to express a moral outrage or a more, he has to make an existential um, outlet mm. for, for, for that denial that has been building up over time. It's like, ah, you know, he's shrugging his shoulders until he's on death row and then he's like ah! did we talk yeah. about his final book the last Man? we did not but i that oh. was fun to talk about uh, so i like him so um so he actually was we as far as we know we did not it's a, a one priest testimony but apparently before he died he was baptized oh, secretly wow. Secretly, and so uh, at a, he died in a car crash so it was not he, you know he was dying and he got back no it was like he got baptized and died uh, unexpectedly a few like months later um but he had left behind an unfinished novel called the La uh, the last man and it's unfinished it's like the first few chapters are kind of written and then there's kind of some notes and so i read the novel and it was fascinating because i think reading the novel i'm like i think he actually became a christian you can tell so one of the things he says it's about his it's basically it's it's not it's a novel but it's basically autobiographical and at one point, the main character, who is Kemu, obviously, you can tell. The main character says this, I thought, something like this, it's been like 30 years. But he says something like, I thought I could create a life for myself with meaning and purpose through my own freedom and agency. This is classic as essentialism. This is Kemu, right? So I thought I could do that. But now I've come to see all this time, I was seeking a father to forgive me. So that, and that's as I read that I was like this. This makes it much more credible that he became a Christian because, again, you can think you can go through your whole life, you can write books and win Nobel prizes, saying I'm going to live courageously, I'm going to live an authentic life and create meaning for myself, and 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 you know, like um, in the plague, right? The doctor who lives for the humanity and to to save people that are sick and to do good work. You can do all this out of just pure aesthetics. I don't believe in God. But then at the end of his life, not knowing it's the end of his life, but Kemu comes to realize all of that in, in the end is not what he needs. All along, he's been seeking forgiveness. And it's and then the, the novel, it's just, it's just notes after that, but 
that's one of the lines in the novel. It's just so fascinating that he even as a hugely important existentialist, at the end of his life came to realize that it all in the end does not matter. What really the ultimate ultimate question is, is, is there a God and is he our father? And do I need to be reconciled to him? So anyway, it's just a really interesting footnote. You should read the book. It's like, a, it's like not finished. I forget who completed, who like, you know, put it together. It's like a son or something. Uh, and then also the, yeah. the title is The Last Man, which is a reference to Jesus, right? The first man is Adam. The last man is Christ. It's in, uh, I think it's like Corinthians, I think. Mm. So the point is, he, he, even, the, even the title, he's thinking in biblical categories now. So anyway, interesting story. Wow, I had no idea. That, yeah, look uh, it up. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm going to have to look that up. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Well, Billy, or James, you're muted. Are you talking? Um, I asked Dan this and uh, Lawrence Krauss, who we had on. Yeah. Is ultimately, we're going to have the heat death of the universe and everything you pretty much do in life is going to be meaningless and, you know, just, you know, you'll die and there's not you know because christianity is only about a 10 percent chance it's true you're not going to have a mansion in heaven you're not going to you know be with god and jesus so why can't you just embrace the meaningless of meaninglessness of life why can't you yeah why can't you like oh i me personally yeah well i don't believe it's meaningless i mean as a, to me it's not 10 percent chance christianity is true it's it's just true Right, well, what's so the percentage that it's true. So I mean, this is one of those things, like psychologically, well, or you know, thirty-seven. Bill, it's one over one thirty-seven. That's yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, the fine structure constant. There you, um, go. you know, I wouldn't put a number on it. I just say it's true, and I I know it's true. Uh, you know, psychologically, if I had to gauge my psychological certainty, you know, some days it's ninety-nine point nine percent. Other days it's like sixty percent. But but it's like saying, uh, does your wife love you? Some days, 99% certainty. When we're having a fight, 60% certainty. Who cares? <laughs> I know my wife loves me. I'm not going to pretend that she doesn't. And I, I, I've learned to not, I'm not trusting in my psychology. That fluctuates. I'm trusting in reality, right? And, and, uh, and knowing, you know, whenever I sort of, am I sure this is true? I'm like, well, all the evidence points that way. I, I and 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 then more than that, ex experientially, Christians do have the Holy Spirit in them, testifying this is true. You are born again. Uh, you once were blind, now you see. So I think, again, I, you know, yeah, do I? I'm not going to be like every day, hundred <laughs> percent. Sure. That's ridiculous. I mean, that's silly. But I also think the question of percentages, like when I became a Christian, what was my percentage when I said? God, if Jesus is your son, I'll follow him. What are you at? 0.1%, 13%? It doesn't matter. My father-in-law says, you look at the Gospels, what, what is conversion in the Gospels? Not in Paul, not in Peter, not in Revelation, but in the Gospels. What does it mean for someone to become a Christian, to be converted? And the answer is like the only thing about them, it's already, they're all very different. They say yes to Jesus. They all say yes to Jesus. They, they all believe him. They all trust him. They follow him. Looks very different. It looks like the thief on the cross is like, remember me, Lord. He's like, yes. The woman, the, in the, we, you know, yeah, it varies. But the, the, the essence of it is just saying yes to him. So the, hey, the Bill, you, we've talked called, about this before, Bill, uh, in a previous book club, but I'll see if you've, you've, your position's changed any on that. You talk about percentages. What's the percentage? And, so you you know there's greater than a zero percent chance that Christianity is true. I can't remember the number you gave, but w what number would you give that Christianity is true? What's the percentage? Well, you would before give? Dale Allison, you know, fifteen, but I have to lower it to ten after listening to a Christian deacon telling me that oh, I don't see a lot of history in the uh, birth narratives. Oh, the post resurrection throw them out. There's so many problems. I just did a debate. Is Christianity true? And I, you know, gave all the reasons. It just there's too many defeaters, Neil. There's just too many problems. And by the way, I look go on YouTube every friggin' day. There's someone saying, "Oh my God, I'm deconverted. I've, 
what, what was I thinking? I was just under this delusion. I was just, and there's a book we're considering, Goodbye Jesus by Tim Sledge, who's a pastor of a 15,000 member church. And he just goes, I was just playing a game. Do you understand, Neil? It's your environment, your culture, your peer group, all these things, not to mention the seminaries and the radio stations. There's all this bias that comes crushing on you, and you're not even aware of what hit you. But like you said, I went to Princeton. It's the opposite for me, right? And Berkeley. I got you for that. Well, that, so it, it, when you say, oh, it's all the culture, I was not raised Christian. I didn't go to Christians. I went to very, I talk a course with Bart Aaron's textbook. So in other Berkeley words. Berkeley is hardly Jerusalem, Bill. That's Berkeley right. Is so it's far away from the, the spiritualities you could possibly. What, what has Berkeley to do with Jerusalem? The, but the point exactly. is. <laughs> that's good. It, your argument works the opposite direction for me personally. It might work for like some person from Alabama. Yeah, you grew up in the church and you don't. But for me, it's the little opposite. It's like, given that I'm a Christian, in the in the teeth of everything I learned in in school, well, gosh, maybe I, have a, I should have a higher percentage most days, just be on the basis of my background, right? I'm not a cultural Christian by any means. And yeah, I have to look at like, all these weird VeggieTales songs. Like, what's VeggieTales? What is that stuff? All these weird slogans. I don't even know the brace. What, WWJD brace. What is that? What is that? I, I'm totally lost in Christian subculture. Yeah, and, and Bill, the, the other thing I would say, even if you've reduced the 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 probability from fifteen percent to ten percent, it still holds up. If I had a ten percent chance of winning the lottery, I would play every time it was available. <laughs> so uh, it, it's uh, again, and maybe that's for a utilitarian Go approach. Play the Muslim to lottery the truth. too, right? Yeah, that, yeah. Well, that's, that's the point. You, but you're not playing the atheist lottery. That's exactly that's the point. Like you, to be consistent, you're like if there's a ten percent chance playing lottery A, ten percent chance lottery B, zero percent chance playing lottery C. I'll never play lottery C. I'll put all my money into A and B. But you can't be like, well, it's only ten percent chance. Yeah, but it's the only one that yields. So it's yeah. it kind of bites you. Comes out and bites you. It. I see through it as a mechanism to that that serves to the advantage of the of the religions that are espousing uh, eternal damnation. Well, if it's yeah. if it's false, yeah. But if it's not, then so it's just I had a question about yeah. the psychology of, of of certainty or of confidence in, in belief. You mentioned that sometimes you're close to a hundred, sometimes sixties or whatever. Let's imagine at at your peak, at your peak confidence in Christianity. Sure. Um, I, I accept that that what you say about your own psychological state of belief is true. I, I grant you that. Mm -hmm. Are you able to grant the same to people outside of the Christian faith? In other words, on my best days, as a if I if I use the word best, it's not, on my most certain days, I'm close to 100% certain that Christianity is not true. Sure. Uh, maybe it might dip down to to 90% or 80%. Sometimes, who knows. Um, uh, but are you, uh, given in the light of Romans 1, I hear some Christians say, well, there's no true atheist, there's no true mm. unbeliever or whatever. Uh, what's your take on that? Do you, do you agree with my own self-assessment that I that I truly don't believe? Or, or do you think somehow inwardly I secretly believe, but I'm just suppressing it? I don't think you believe that you believe. I think you believe deep dead inside because the Bible says you do. Right. But I wouldn't say like if that's like saying someone like, uh, I mean, the, the, the people that say, no, you're lying. You do believe and you're just lying about your belief. They don't really take seriously the, the suppressing the truth. We suppress the truth in our rights. I mean, I think C.S. Lewis talks about at some point, an alcoholic truly believes a drink will give do him no more harm. He really believes it psychologically. Right. He's come to the state where he really, truly. But, you know, it's it's some deep, deep, deep. He knows it won't. Right. I mean, it's, 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 there's layers of our conscious. You want to invoke Freud if you want to. But, you know, so consciously, yeah, you know, consciously you have certainty that of uh, certain of certain things that but the deep down inside you can you kind of really know. There, there, I mean, there's they're literally I mean, this is actually probably fairly common in the U.S., at least in a Christian post-Christian culture. But probably there are a lot of people who, you know, live as atheists. I'm an atheist. I'm an atheist. But then they're, you know, they're get they're in a car crash. They're on the side of the road bleeding. Who are they calling out to? Jesus, right? 
Now, I'm not saying like, but you know, they're not calling out to Allah, Buddha, you know, right? right? The, the point is now, does that mean, oh, see, but my point is the staunchest atheist by their own <laughs> actions can tend to say there's something in deep down inside. Now, no, by the way, sure, they're terrified. There's, they're just throwing a Hail Mary. I get that. But they, but, it, you know, who, but they're not. I don't throw a Hail Mary, you know, by you know, doing some Scientology ritual, right? Well, so I, mean, I, I grew up in Africa and there was most in a Muslim environment. Um, and I remember as a teenager, uh, there was somebody who who swore they were they, they took God's name in vain, but it wasn't, oh, God, it was Allah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, that sort of thing, uh, you know, and I, I remember thinking, wow, they 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 swear with their own God, you know, and we swear with our own God, you know, it's, it's cultural. I'm, just, I'm, I'm not saying exactly it is. I'm, not, I'm agreeing it's cultural, but I'm saying is what's, what's the atheist supposedly doesn't believe in any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But when the, when the, when push comes to shove, what are, they, what are they not doing? The atheist gets in a car accident, is on the roadside dying. They're not like, get me a healing crystal. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just not. Why? Cause they don't, they really don't believe that. They just don't, no one's calling for healing crystal or homeopathic medicine. Because they don't believe that. Yeah. So what are they calling on? The thing that they like, well, there's something in them. They're kind of like, maybe, maybe. I think you can have nominal atheists just like you can have nominal. Yeah, yeah. People are just apathyists maybe is what I would call them. Yeah, there's yeah. certainly yeah. those. Yeah. There is actually, hey, Jim, I, I'd want to point out on the, the suppression thing. Um, I don't personally see it as an atheist problem. I think it's a human problem. I mean, I'm a Christian. I believe in God, but. You know, when God's revealing stuff to me, I really think he is. I, I tend to suppress it myself. That's or right. Procrastinate, and so I'm not responding. It doesn't mean I'm lying. I don't really believe in God or I would embrace it. I mean, I know I ought to embrace it, but my tendency is part of the part of the human flaw or the total depravity. I, I tend to suppress that myself. Romans 7. Right. Paul talks yeah. about this. It's not yeah. like it's I mean, not Romans um, 1. There, there's some atheists who make an argument uh, against Christian Believe, the sincerity of Christian belief, just like atheists will make against the sincerity of atheist belief, and saying, "Well, if you really, if you really thought that people were going to hell, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be watching any TV shows. You wouldn't sure. be, you know, you would be out knocking on doors." Yeah, pin Gillette. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I just say that's an argument for for Christian Christian sin. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, you know, I, I think that shows that yeah, we're we're, we're hypocrites. That's why we need the yeah. grace of the gospel. Oh, one last thing on this topic. I did see a study, and again, this could be just one of these Twitter things you see, and it's not true. But Google it and try to find it. But there was a study that actually took um, atheists from like Norway and had them a, a lie detector test, and they they had the, they measured their like you know physical reactions. And they had them, you know, blaspheme Allah or you know Shiva, or, and then but when they and they they're like you're atheist, I don't believe any of this stuff. But when they got to Jesus, they're nervous. Now, obviously, I'm not saying see they knew it's Jesus. I'm just saying that culture. I'm showing you that what you intellectually claim you're certain about. Yeah, your heart's something different. I, I'm not saying see they knew Jesus. I'm just saying it's it's we lie to ourselves all the time. I'm out there being like, I'm totally not afraid of that thing. And then when it happens, I'm like, I'm terrified of it. Yeah. So you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's funny. Um, there's a guy here in Texas, Ken, maybe you've seen him. He's the Bushman, the Texas Bushman. He has a YouTube video and he sits like a shrub down on the river in San Antonio where tourists come by. He's a black guy. He's hilarious. And I just, I binge watched his videos, but every time, 75 to 80 percent of the time when he gets a reaction from the tourists they all yelp out jesus christ you know uh, there's there's not vishnu or allah or gandhi you know they, they like all America, yelp. if it was in india jesus they might say shiva yeah. <laughs> maybe i don't know but i was I, I i didn't watch these you know looking at that thinking oh i'm going to see how many times this happens but it just happened over and over again everybody was like oh my god jesus or oh my god yeah. you know so again i'm not saying see therefore they know but yeah. but i think what to neil's point there's something innate about about uh about that and it, it may be cultural but i i think it is because so that was so ingrained in me that i have never i don't think i've ever said oh my god in a, in a like in a 
in that kind of an, in that kind of way. Ejaculation. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah or, ejaculation. Or Jesus right. Christ, or I, I think, I think it's a, never it, once done that in my whole life. It's basically, I think it just it basically is an argument, though, that we don't know ourselves. We mm-hmm. think we know ourselves. We think, oh, I'm, I, I believe it, but we don't really. There are depths of our. It is, a, it's a totally humanistic claim that we think we know our our own hearts. We think we know our own thoughts. We don't really. Right. We, we deceive ourselves into thinking that, yeah. and when and that and that gives that's that ought to give people pause when they make these arguments like, well, I, I just know this is the true. And, uh, as insofar as you think, well, you know that was my point in my opening statement or yeah. opening question was that, are you sure that you're not influenced by the human depravity? Even if, even if you think it's covered by your religion, your religious faith, uh, what if you are the product of an evolutionary, um, set of processes that led to flawed thinking just like it has for me or anybody else how are you somehow immune from that i mean you could be so you you could be self-convinced these are really great arguments like you could convince yourself yeah, yeah. i mean they you know on paper they they sound great but what if they're just rationalizations for something you want to believe uh, you know or that you've been influenced to believe w- well this is your, why i think you knowing <clears throat> This is sort of Descartes' problem, and I would say I think you know he has the cogito, but I think we can more than that. We can have foundational beliefs, like so an obvious one. You know, I think therefore I am sure. But then you could, I would just go way farther than that. Like, do do you really need strong evidence that uh, words exist or that two plus two equals four? Is that just doubting those things is just is just frankly stupid. Like I, I will, ne- like, you know, that's. But I, I've come to realize the moral realm is one of those things I don't need to doubt. It's I, I encounter it. I don't bump into, but I I bump into it. Just living as a human, I bump into the need to seek the truth. I don't have and to I acknowledge that moral realm, right? So the the, the point is, and then the question. Then, so that, so the point is, you're like, well, how do you know you're not just deceiving yourself? I, I don't know. How do you know? How do I know that words exist? I just it, it's inconceivable they don't. And th- but then I'm like, okay, well, what? reality explains that and frankly for all the reasons i gave the only reality that explains that and actually in some atheists that i quoted in the book will admit that if you believe in an objective moral realm you have to believe in god I mean, hey everyone i, I hate yeah. to uh, yeah. all good things must end i hate to say that we're we are about out of time uh we are out of time yeah. but uh <laughs> just as a little bit of a wrap up uh neil i want to say thank you so much for being part of our book club this was a, a uh i really enjoyed our conversation i think i speak for everyone did you have one last word we'll sign off one last advice or encouragement for atheists in the club and also for for christians Yeah, I would just lean on the final section of my book. I guess like people observed a lot of it's very common arguments you hear a lot. But I think that final section where it's talking about the gospel as evidence is something new. And I think it's extremely important for Christians to really internalize the idea that the gospel really is the heart of why we believe and why we should believe. Not just like, oh, it's just experience, just that, no, this makes sense of reality. This makes sense of your reality and we should hang on to that um, and not be ashamed of like, don't be ashamed of the gospel, not even intellectually, because it makes sense. Well, thank you so much again. Our our book for February is to be determined. Um, we have not heard back yet, but we did read, reach out to Dan Barker, former Christian minister, now atheist. Uh, he's the co-president with his wife of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. He's, he, he, the book that we're wanting to talk with him about is his autobiography entitled Losing Faith in Faith from Preacher to Atheist. So uh, we haven't heard back yet, but uh, to be honest, you guys, we, I know a lot more Christian writers and um I live in that realm more than the atheist realm. And if you have some suggestions before you sign off, I'm going to leave the room open for just a little bit. If you want to put a suggested title for an atheist book or author, and we'll go try to see if we can uh, to, to make that happen. So in the text, if you want to suggest a particular book or author, just do that right now. And uh, we will go ahead and close out the book club. And until next month, we will see you then. Thank you, guys. Nice meeting you, Bill and Ken. Yes, thanks. Great great conversation. I enjoyed it.